Good morning still for the next 10 minutes. This is my opportunity to tell you and show you what I believe the evidence will show. You've heard the state's opening statement and now I will give mine. We have two very different outlooks on the events of August 25th of 2020. It is the ultimate degree of entitlement when people believe that this is how they're supposed to be. What the right is saying about Kyle Rittenhouse is that, well, the government didn't do its job, so it took a 17-year-old kid to come in and do what was right. That's vigilantism. You are stupid. Yes, I know. That's insulting, but it's also the truth. Hello, and welcome back to Wish for Death Island, Population Me. Today we have some big topics to tackle. We're talking about something that blew so out of proportion that no one was really able to conceptualize how big it would be. And why? Activists. Gay ops. Pick something, I don't know. Today we're going to talk about the events, the media reaction, and the detailed proceedings of the court footage. And the title? Oh, the title is just 100% facts. Past comment equating him to white supremacy. Well, look. I stand by what the jury has concluded. This is gonna be a long video, okay? So get your... Uh, what, do, what do the kids drink these days? Fucking gamer Is that what you drink? I still haven't tried that. Should I try that? If there's an ube flavor, I would try it, I think. Just before we begin, I have new products. I have a handmade clay figurine mystery pack set featuring Tub Tub and his friends. There's 12 designs, so why not spend your life savings on tearing open these tantalizing mystery packs to see what they are? I'm gonna be using some art footage as the background for this video so I can just, you know, make it a bit easier for myself. The camera is very blurry and I really apologize for that. I don't really have good equipment in terms of recording, but I'm really trying my best, so please be patient with me. Listen, I'm here for the facts, I am, but I'm not gonna try and pretend like I'm not a biased supporter of Kyle Rittenhouse and the Second Amendment in America. I'm not gonna try and pretend that I don't hate the media already. I'm gonna show all the evidence, because I have evidence, but trying to act like I'm not opinionated. <laughs> I'm gonna ignore anything too persnickety for the overview section of this video because the persnickety stuff arises in the court footage and when we get to that stuff, I don't want you to be too bored at having to hear it over and over again because trust me, I watched all of the court footage and I got really fucking bored. But I'd say overall it's pretty wild. I mean, how wild can a court thing really be? Shoot me nigger, shoot me nigger. Well that's a good start. Oh, ay, 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 ay. You've been drinking too much tequila. Let's duel! So it begins when Kyle and his friend Dominic are just hanging out. Dominic is Kyle's sister's boyfriend and older than Kyle, so he has a gun and his family goes hunting and whatnot. Normal stuff. Kyle also thinks it would be cool to have a gun himself, but he's 17. So he and Dominic decide that Kyle can pay for a gun to be purchased, but it's kept in Dominic's name and it's kept in Dominic's dad's safe where Kyle cannot access it unless Kyle is under their supervision, like when they go hunting and whatnot. When Kyle turns 18, he will get the gun and it's all legal, with plenty of safety precautions being taken. But then we get to the incident that causes the riots to begin. Jacob Blake was a man who was basically unlawfully trying to spirit away some children that he shouldn't have in his car when he was stopped by the police, pulled a knife on them, and then they ended up shooting him. 
he's a paraplegic now, but very much alive. However, at the time, things were very politically charged and angry, so the BLM rioters took to the streets over what they perceived as an innocent black man being murdered by the police. Many people still believe he's dead to this day. Even his own dad said that he's dead on the news interview. Being dead is better for optics, I guess. So, the riots began, and a place by the name of Kenosha got a taste of some of the chaos. Kyle lived just outside of Kenosha, but his friends lived in Kenosha, Kyle worked there, so he went there every day. He was a part of the community in Kenosha. Seeing what was happening, he and his friends went and cleaned some graffiti and whatnot, just doing little tasks here and there to clean up the community in the day. They had also run into a business owner at some point by the name of Sam and his brother, who owned a series of locations of used car lots called Car Source. There were three locations. Sam was concerned because the rioters were going around lighting up cars, breaking windows, basically destroying things. That's what they do. So Kyle's friends ended up agreeing to come back later to look after the property and just help out a bit. After that, Kyle and his friends went home and also had gone to purchase some straps to carry their firearms to make sure that they could still have them while being hands-free, while doing other things. In Kyle's instance, the other thing is giving people medical aid with the supplies that he kept in his car. Kyle worked as a lifeguard at the pool, so he had a little bit of knowledge about that. The guys meet up at one of the business locations, a used car lot called Car Source, and take a picture together because the business owner's brother said that they looked really cool and wanted to get a photo with them. There were other people who were also going to protect the property and Kyle's group didn't know them but all of them kind of got acquainted and set about doing it. The group split up between the three locations, a group of them to cover each of them, and Kyle's group went to the second location. His friends stood on the roof with their firearms to oversee things and keep an eye out for any violent people, while Kyle was on the ground to ask people if they needed medical help and if any passers-by needed some assistance. These people would cross over onto the property and get some aid. However, a lot of the rioters weren't really happy about that. For example, one of the people who was going onto the property to get assistance was yelled at by one of the rioters something to the effect of, don't let them treat you so it wasn't all friendly. Kyle would also wander around outside of the castle's property to try and call to more people to see if they needed a medic. At one point while he and his friend were walking, a man named Richard McGuinness was filming for a website following the riots and he asked Kyle for an interview. Kyle said some things and then Richard decided to follow them for a little bit. Kyle was walking and there was a big crowd so it was quite disorienting. However, Kyle turned around at one point and realized that his friend was no longer with him. The two had been separated in the mess. So he managed to get to the gas station and waited there in the safety of some other people to see what he could do. It was then that he got a call from his friend Nick, who said that the third location of car source was on fire and they urgently needed some assistance over there. Kyle managed to get a fire extinguisher from someone around him and started running there as fast as he could. On the way, it seemed like a man in a red shirt carrying a plastic bag was also lurking around there. He ran over to the cars and then confronted Kyle for no particular reason. The man's name was Rosenbaum and he had been looking for a fight, having said, I don't care about going back to jail, where he had gone for multiple counts of pedophilia related crimes. The man, Rosenbaum, threw his bag at Kyle and started running at him, trying to provoke him into the shooting. Kyle raised his gun as a deterrent, but Rosenbaum kept running, getting so close to lunge at Kyle and actually grab for the gun. Kyle had no choice but to shoot to defend himself, because Rosenbaum was planning to kill him. After four shots in quick succession, Rosenbaum was dead. Kyle was disoriented and vaguely heard people running and screaming about a killer. He didn't know what to do, so he called his friend because it was the first number he saw on his phone and splattered out that he had shot someone. He didn't want to, but he was forced to. He hung up and decided the best thing to do was to immediately find the cops to turn himself in. The mob was now assembling to come after him, because people kept shouting about there being an active shooter, and he had to run. He couldn't explain himself to these people because they already made their mind up and they wanted to kill him. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before other assailants got him. For example, a man named Hubert, who had been in jail for violent acts against women, and was carrying a skateboard to use as a weapon. He struck Kyle, had to raise his arms to defend himself so that his neck was protected because of the force that Hubert was using. Hubert kept bashing him even when Kyle was on the ground. Whether he even knew that people were calling Kyle a shooter or not, he was there for violence and that was clear. Kyle was also forced to shoot Hubert as the attack continued to save his own life. 
There was another man, unidentified, who kicked Kyle's face in as he lay on the ground struggling to get his bearings. Kyle finally manages to get to his feet. A man named Gage Groschkreutz approached with his hands up. Kyle, seeing this, lowered his gun to the ground, because he didn't think that Gage was really going to do anything if he had his hands raised. However, this was a ploy. Gage is waiting for Kyle to put the gun down so he could go for his Glock, forcing Kyle to act quicker than Gage to save his own life. Gage didn't die, but his bicep was destroyed. Kyle manages to get to the police that were just around at the scene, but it doesn't go as he expected. One of the cops in a police car tries to shout at Kyle, Kyle doesn't know what's happening, and the guy tries to spray pepper spray at Kyle so Kyle backs away. The line of police tells Kyle that he should just go home. Kyle can't turn himself into the actual Kenosha police because the station is entirely taken over and barricaded because of the rise. So, Kyle decides to get a ride home with his friend back to his house, and his family talks about what to do. His mum, in a panic, briefly brings up hiding Kyle away somewhere, but Kyle says that it's the right thing to do to turn himself into the police and see what happens. The police, when he gets there, don't even know what happened. They hadn't gotten any reports that someone died, there was no one wanting Kyle to be arrested, like, he could have just gotten away with it if he wanted to, but he didn't want to, because that wasn't the right thing to do. Kyle felt that it was a moral obligation to alert them of the fact that he did this, and that's what kickstarted the entire thing. Stupid! You've got to put in bills! Give me all the bills you have! Uh, right. Don't be so stingy! You've got another bill- We've all heard about self-defense cases before, and it's pretty common, honestly. This isn't new. A lot of the time, there isn't really much of a media circus around it. But, as you can tell, this one was different especially because of the politics involved. Even once the information had come out that Jacob Blake wasn't some innocent guy and he wasn't even dead afterwards, the media decided to pursue the story with the lies that made them look better and gave them more money from the cliques. BLM never cared about the truth, and ruthless foot soldiers for the cause were ready to dox and attack people who said otherwise. Rittenhouse's case became a litmus test. It wasn't about the facts, the facts showed he did nothing wrong, but the litmus test was about the side that you were on. The activists needed you to believe that Kyle was a violent white supremacist who was going around killing innocent black people, and that he had somehow idolized the cops who were mistakenly also labeled as violent white supremacists. I don't know enough to know whether that 17-year-old kid, uh, exactly what he did, but allegedly he's part of a militia coming out of the state of Illinois. Have you ever heard this president say one negative thing? about white supremacists. When people think it's okay to take the law into their own hands, instead of allowing law enforcement to do its job. And the president <coughs> believes in condemning hatred, division, and violence. That's exactly what was done in that video. If you didn't believe that, then the litmus test was failed and you were the enemy. Let me remind you, everyone Kyle shot that night was white, and they were all trying to attack him and kill him. But there are still people today who think Kyle shot black people because of the lies perpetuated by the media. It's very hard to explain the absolute craziest shit that was in the media if you weren't following it at the time, but I will try my best to recap some of the funny stuff. Some people were claiming that Kyle had shot as many as 60 times. And this was when the footage was available as well, so there's no reason to say that besides outright lies. There were also people who totally lost their minds. Kyle Rittenhouse was in possession of an illegal weapon and that he crossed state lines with that <laughs> oh, no. weapon. Okay? Rittenhouse crossed state lines into a community that was not his. Rittenhouse traveled across state lines uh, to go to Kenosha and he murdered two protesters. Willing to drive across state lines to commit murder. Because obviously we're dealing with a 17 year old from out of state. The View is a panel of some of the dumbest room temperature IQ people I've ever seen. There can be an entire three hour video alone on how the they just say the worst takes imaginable. They blame Trump for his own attempted assassination recently. They have said people should be persecuted for not getting the COVID vaccine at the time. They questioned if the earth was flat for some reason. Is the world flat? Is the world flat? Yes. I don't know. And they call people racist over nothing, routinely. They also didn't have good takes on Kyle, as you can imagine, and all of the wine moms watching daytime TV because they didn't have anything better to do agreed. Kyle gets off. Really does hurt us with, with protests. The Young Turks were full 
also perpetuated this lie that Kyle had crossed state lines in the sense that he had come from somewhere far away and wasn't actually one of the Kenosha community members themselves that just happened to live slightly outside of Kenosha. There was now this narrative that self-defense was a sign of evil, and if a leftist mob decided to attack you, clearly you did something wrong in the first place and you needed to just take your punishment and lie down. That's not what, people are not supposed to be vigilantes. We're not supposed to be taking um, justice into our own hands. This is my, I pay taxes here and therefore I, no, if something, if I see someone breaking the law, I call the cops. That's what they're there for. This is, it, it's supposed to be about law and order. People become upset and they take to the streets and they start to protest. And then you say, well, why aren't you protesting peacefully? Well, they, you tried. So what would, what do you have people do? This is also a reminder that Kyle was 17 at the time and had to go to a safe house to live during the year that he was waiting for his trial because of the activists blatantly calling for his murder. Some f like really shitty civil suits and people being fired for supporting Kyle. It was a sh really weird thing, so I'm gonna talk about that as well. Think of this as like the pre-hearing, pre-trial information. People were saying that Kyle can't claim self-defense because he was committing a crime by carrying a gun as an underage person. This isn't even... I don't know why you would say that. It's retarded. But he was carrying a gun as an underage person in Kenosha, and the statute is not technically saying that it's illegal for him to do this. The statute was specifically for anyone carrying illegal guns that even adults weren't supposed to use. Kyle's gun was perfectly within the law, and Kyle himself wasn't buying the gun, which was the illegal part. If he had bought the gun himself in his own name, that would have been the illegal part, but he didn't, so this isn't actually a point. But it's one of those things that people do when they can't concretely get you on one thing, they try and nitpick something else and say, well, you did that, that's wrong, therefore you did the other thing, which is also wrong, even though there's clearly... it's not correct to begin with. What the statute actually says is that as long as the weapon isn't one of those illegal ones across the board, like a cannon or a short barrel, they're not in trouble for carrying for a minor, just carrying one of them, like holding it, possession as in holding it. Kyle wasn't actually charged with this and it doesn't make sense that he could be because it would be thrown out immediately by the lawyer just reading aloud the statute in court. A police officer, completely unrelated to the case, was also fired for donating $25 for Kyle's legal defense fund in his own private time, in his own life. The argument was that it's not ethical or legal for him to do such a thing as a police officer. There was also a Twitter account that was linked to Kyle, whatever that means, and people were pointing to it because they were so desperate to try and find something on this kid that Free Kyle USA, a Twitter account that was following the Kyle thing and supporting him, who didn't even have any relation to Kyle, was somehow a reason for Kyle to go to jail. They were really foaming at the mouth, trying to make anything stick to Kyle to destroy him when there really wasn't anything there. This shit is like if there was an owner of a fan account for a Taylor Swift Twitter account that was involved in a robbery and Taylor didn't even know that the account existed but she was attached to it as if it was her fault because her name's associated with it. Like Kyle originally had a sort of PR lawyer called John who was not really fit for the role so they went for a local firm who was in charge and Robert Barnes was in charge. He went around speaking to a bunch of people about the case and you can watch some of the interviews. It's not entirely relevant for what I want to talk about but it's there if you want. Kyle was also moved to his safe house at this time because he had to be protected due to the amount of activists who openly called for his murder and violence to his family simply for him defending himself. His humanity was now forfeit because of the political sides on display. Being an innocent teenager, th those people still want him dead because they want to show loyalty to the side that they picked, that they treated as an outright religion, and he didn't show his own loyalty to them, so it was his fault for him being in any harm's way. It's quite disgusting when you think about it, huh? A civil suit <laughs> that was dropped, by the way, but I really have to talk about this. It had nothing to do with the criminal trial for the murder, but there had been a bullshit, bullshit case that was attempted to be attached to him politically as an attempt to stack the sins that he had committed against him in conjunction with the murder trial. This was purely an activist thing for money as well. The suit was in September 2020 and it, it got dropped, but I, I'm going to talk about it. But the fact that it was in 2020, it was kind of under the radar in comparison to like the murder sort of stuff and all the other things. So you might not have heard of this, but I am definitely going to talk about it. <laughs> The civil suit was in relation to Huber, who you can recall from the recap was the guy who hit Kyle with the skateboard. This suit was brought by the partner of Huber, who was making it a racial thing? Huber's partner was actually, and like I, I need to stress actually, Kyle defending his own life, like against a white man by the way, 
was taking rights away from black people and minorities. As one of the minorities I, myself, I, I gotta say how fucking disgusted I am at Huber and his partner and anyone who agreed with the suit for this. This is absolutely retarded. They also dig up an old civil rights era law that was put in place specifically around that time to prevent retaliation crime and hate crimes towards blacks by angry racists during this period. To use the laws meant to protect actual vulnerable black people during the civil rights era all the way back then. To now apply to a teenager you don't like because of your partner's violent actions, I have no words for how scummy and awful you are to even consider doing this. It's like someone breaking into your house and if you try to chase them out, they say, actually my great great grandpa was probably a slave I think, so if you disphone yourself against me, you're the same as the evil slave owner who rapes and murders his slaves and like, I'm a victim of that. I actually, you know what, that's real. During the riots in 2020, a democrat representative actually had a live stream discussion with a woman who said the lineage of slavery makes someone's actions not their own responsibility. I'm not joking. There's a don't walk run productions video on it and it is insane. That's not even a joke anymore, it's just real. We often think of harm solely as interpersonal, right? And so an individual is harmed and then if it is deemed criminal, the state will step in on behalf of that individual and advocate for their, their behalf in court and then the person who, who did the harm will be punished. Right. Wait, what's the problem? And so then I want to then link to sort of the second part of my of my work and my research that really informs how I think about this moment. And that's the work of transformative justice. Transformative justice is when the offender sits down in a room with a transformative justice practitioner and the harmed individual. Then everyone involved figures out what the offender needs to do to make things right. Maybe they need to pay the harmed individual restitution, or maybe the offender apologizes and promises to never do it again. And so if we're thinking about a person who took your car, transformative justice practitioners would then ask, okay, but how is that person who took your car, how have they been harmed on an interpersonal and structural level? So the civil suit was legitimately a woke suit. I do know that sometimes people use the word woke over nothing and there's nothing really woke going on. Believe me, I know that, but this legitimately is a, it counts as woke. I don't know why it wasn't dropped sooner than it was. But prosecutors in Wisconsin were saying that Kyle was a racist because he defended himself and didn't just lie down and die. I keep bringing up lie down and die, but that's genuinely one of the rhetorics that was going around at the time. For example, one of the bread tubers named Vosh, who, uh, if you don't know, is the guy that everybody knows because he defends pedophilia and he had a, a wank folder full of drawings of small children getting raped by horses, so I don't think you should take anything he says seriously. He legitimately argued that if a mob is chasing you, then they must have some sort of justified anger and you need to lie down and die. It's in the context there and how legitimate the lethal threat is. I, I do believe that. I think that there's a lot of nuance there. But I'll listen, okay. all I know is I've seen a lot of Marvel movies and in the part where the good guy gets framed and he turns around and there are a bunch of angry p cops and civilians staring at him, uh, he drops the gun and puts his hand up in the air and he doesn't fucking unleash the, the fucking Iron Man laser and cut down 300 people uh, uh, who are threatening him implicitly by surrounding him and not allowing him free access out. So maybe well, that's in my... in real life, if you spend a lot of time on live leaks or Ogrish or any other, like, gore site, you can see that where one guy throws his hands up and a mob comes up and somebody throws one punch that kills him and then people cut his intestines out and they drag it over the street. Um, so, I mean, Is like, I don't know. I guess it typically happens in the United States? It's not a matter of it typically happening. I mean, like, there have been people that have been killed in these in these protests and riots so far. And I mean, like, who's to say that you're not going to be the next? Like, I don't know. I mean, I there have been at least right. 20 Marvel movies. I doubt you can find that many live leak videos of people being killed. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hinge my bet. But this was the rhetoric that was going around at the time, believe it or not. People in the media were also bringing up minor infractions, like Kyle drinking a beer at a pub with his parents as an 18-year-old, which is also legal, by the way, because it was uh, in the presence of adult supervision, which is under the, the legal <laughs> way to drink. At the pub he was at, he flashed a racist sign. By the way, the racist sign is an okay sign, which was, I think, a 4chan gay op that the left actually took as a real thing and now it's a racist symbol. Never mind people like Obama who have done it on camera. I guess he's a white supremacist now, eh? But they're trying to stick hate groups to him as if he associates with them when he doesn't at all. Like he probably doesn't know who they are. 
But Kyle was stuck in such a horrible political situation that he had to acquiesce to certain ridiculous prosecutor demands because it was the only way to get the court to kind of proceed with the trial. Remember, this is about politics to them, but to Kyle it's just him being punished for having the audacity to want to live when someone's trying to take his life. And he has to do whatever he can to try and get his story out there, even if it's to acquiesce to little things here and there that seem kind of retarded. During this time, while the case was being set up in such a way, be the cause of the riot, the Jacob Blake shooting, was revealed to be justified because Blake was pulling a knife and was the aggressor in the situation. And it was being fueled in such a way that the activist prosecutors were feeling the pressure to further stack the racism against Kyle. However, what's really funny is that the prosecutors' same law firm, their same colleagues, actually had found the cops who shot Blake as innocent because of this scenario. So Binger, and I forgot who this guy's name is, I'm gonna call him Glorb, the really fat guy, but both of them were associated with the trial where Blake was found to be the one in the wrong in this situation, right? If Kyle had also tried to make this into some sort of political thing himself, he probably would have been thrown in jail and he would have been retarded because his life's on the line. You have plenty of time to fight against the, the culture war once you're a free person, a free man, instead of rotting in prison. So just do your best to survive and then you'll have time later to play like that. They basically wanted to influence the trial as much as possible and made every leftist accusation at him. You know, every ism that they could find. Stuff that wasn't even true. News corps like ABC were framing his actions as shooting marchers when they were violent assailants and harassers that the footage shows were not provoked by him in any way. They were also framing Blake as an innocent victim as if he wasn't fighting the police in front of his children. Kyle was supposed to be in that car lot that night and he wasn't just trespassing on their property. There were a lot of other people there as well. The rioters started to attack them for protecting the property and it essentially became one of those weird arguments where, where when you defend yourself from someone trying to attack you or invade your space, people say, why do you value objects and property more than the people's lives that you took trying to defend yourself? It's such a stupid argument. You also see this with robberies as well. If someone breaks into someone's house and the person who and the owner of the house shoots the person to protect him and his family, the media will be like, why did you shoot him? Why do you value your house over human life? And it's always like, well, actually, why did the burglar value furniture and random shit over his own life? Because he knew if he went in there, someone's gonna defend their property, but he still went in there because he thought that it would, it would be funny to go in there and steal something. So. I don't- I don't think this means what you think it means. But one of the dirty things about this was that the prosecution team wanted all of the names of the donators who donated to Kyle's legal campaign public, disguising it as wanting to know who is in the jury and who could potentially be a jury member that was actually a Kyle supporter, but they clearly don't need to know all of the names. They could have just looked up the names of the people in the jury pool and matched it to the donators to see if they had donated. You don't need a list of all of the donors to check against the jurors. This is clearly something that was just disguised as wanting to make sure that the jurors were all clean from any bias. It was just something that the activists wanted to know. And let me remind you, the activists attacked people outside of the courthouse as well. It would be very, very dangerous to have all of these names public. Let's continue to the biggest section of this video. Do you know who I am? They call me Judgment Boy. Do you know who I am? I am Judgment Boy. Judgment! Before we begin, let me talk about my sources. The entire trial was streamed for the public, as I believe that trials like this should be so that we can see if there's any corruption afoot with, like with police body cams. We need footage, I agree with this. But as a layman, I watched some of the lawyers covering this to kind of break down the terms that I'm not familiar with. If you have seen my Depp trial video, I'm basically doing the same thing. Unfortunately, a good resource for this case ended up being what later became a, a child neglecting cokehead alcoholic who looks like he's slowly transforming into a ghoul from Fallout. You're not supposed to take cosplay that seriously, man. Go to the doctor, maybe? So now Rikata is a complete and total fuck up, but his hosting of the streams at the time is still an important resource because of the other people there as well. For example, Runkle of the Bailey, Emily Baker, Attorney Tom, Nate the Lawyer examples. All of these people 
are great with their own rundowns of the legal case, so please understand the footage that I'm using here and the context behind it. Also, a dirty little trick that sometimes I pull when I deal with potentially copyrighted footage is to play the footage through someone else's video or archive of the footage and credit them. Because when you upload a video to YouTube, it kind of processes the video and then when you download a video, it processes it. So the layers of processing makes it so that the copyright bot can't really see what's in the footage or detected anymore and then I can get away with the copyrighted footage using someone else's footage with it. <laughs> so if, if you want to make a video and you want to take footage from one of my videos or something like please feel free to do that if it helps you it really helps. So for the hearing there were a bunch of things that like I said dirty kind of social justice type of things that the prosecutors were trying to bring into the case. And some of these things obviously needed to not be in the case because it was just straight up dishonest, but some of the things they kind of just were like, you know, okay. The biggest thing with this case was not that the murders had occurred because we all saw the footage that Kyle had to shoot people. However, the case was for the reasonableness of Kyle. The reasonableness is basically if you truly believe that you are in a situation where you have to fight for your life, then you reacting in self-defense is completely normal and it's what anyone would do. If you were unreasonable, it shows that your intentions here were not very good, or maybe you weren't in the right state of mind and you perceived there was a threat when there wasn't one. So it's kind of that messy area here. This is also one of the reasons why people like the prosecution, for example, were trying to smear him as racist, sexist, xenophobic, whatever, because it paints him as unreasonable. If it shows that he has some sort of horrific ideas about people based on the things that they can't control about themselves, then it shows that he could potentially show up there specifically to kill someone. They also bring up the estate of Joseph Rosenbaum. Even though Rosenbaum was a homeless meth addict pedophile, I don't know what his estate is. Was, he, is it, was his estate the plastic bag that he threw at somebody? They're also trying to add the race's emotions to help understand Kyle's unstable state of mind, including a video of Kyle's sister fighting some other girl, and then Kyle stepping in to intervene because he wanted to help his sister. And the fucking. Th this guy, Binger, the lawyer, is like, but he shouldn't have stepped in to help his sister because the fight was clearly consensual. It uh, has two prongs to it. One is with regard to that June 1st fight. That is a fight uh, which has been captured on video. It is an incident in which uh, it's my understanding that the defendant's sister uh, got into a physical altercation with another female. This was essentially a one-on-one -on -one fight, um, somewhat of a consensual fight. Both of them uh, interested in uh, assaulting one another. Begins to add on uh, to what his sister is doing to this other female. Such a scummy thing to say. But if anything, it makes Kyle look more reasonable to me that he doesn't want people to fight. That That's my thing. The prosecutor, and this was dismissed as well. This wasn't led into the trial because it has absolutely nothing to do with the shit in the trial. Also, the beer thing was dismissed because it has nothing to do with the trial. The prosecutor also brings up that Kyle is a vigilante who just does things that doesn't concern him. He also brings up the sister thing again as an example of something that doesn't concern him. Your own sibling is is a person that you shouldn't be concerned with? Huh? He wasn't asked to go out and guard the parking lot, but he, he directly was by the business owners. That That's an actual lie. Binger also brings up Kyle being serenaded to in a bar that had a kind of connection to the Proud Boys, despite there being absolutely no evidence of Kyle wanting this interaction to happen or even knowing who they were. We have since learned that those individuals that were serenading the defendant consist of the higher, highest echelon of the Wisconsin Proud Boys chapter, including their leader, uh, their current sergeant at arms, their former sergeant at arms, and other high-ranking members of that organization. They're dirtying his association with anyone to make him look uncomfortable. They're, they're dirtying any sort of social interaction that he has to make him look unreasonable. Kyle doesn't align himself with the Proud Boys or any other group, he, d he doesn't care. But Binger insists that this was all coordinated events for meeting up at the bar, as if they're colluding, when there's literally no evidence of this. Binger is justifying their dirty tricks as context, when it's definitely not. Binger even says everyone was there because of their feelings towards Jacob Blake's treatment, when he has absolutely no idea if that's the case, because people show up in big crowds when they see it, something things happening for any reason. 
any protest could attack opportunists and people who react to those people. People who just want to cause a mess, people who just want to see what's going on and don't know what's happening. Binger is a state prosecutor, so he he's very department actually found the cop who shot Blake innocent because Blake is a violent felon. So it's weird how this lawyer is trying to like frame these things without directly saying that the race card and trying to play into BLM's hands because he knows that he technically can't but he's trying to because for him this is a career move. He wants the power that's associated with these things so he has to try to do his best to really show how much he hates white supremacist Rittenhouse when at the same time he can't technically do that because they're in a courthouse and he has a history of dealing with the actual Jacob Blake situation as well. It's very interesting to watch him. The defendant, I believe, uh, was drawn to this incident because of his beliefs, which are consistent with those of the Proud Boys. I believe that those beliefs include a desire to use violence to support that philosophy. How could you possibly prove that? How c could you make his self-defense unjust when he was provoked? This, Bingo makes it sound like the view of Blake being justifiably shot is like a white supremacist racist view. But if that's the case, your department is also a bunch of racists then. Because you share that belief. Also, none of the things that they bring up actually show his state of mind, as I've said. They're just things about his character or personality that aren't even true. And they're not showing proof of his state of mind being murderous. However, you can actually show that he was quite calm and level-headed because there were pictures of him handing out water, cleaning up graffiti, tending to people, and it shows that he actually didn't have a malicious intent to be there, but you can look at the footage of the people who attacked him, lighting fires, hitting other people, and it shows that their intent was clearly violent as well. But Kyle is the bad guy because someone else made tweets about him. After the prosecutor said their piece, the defense replied that it's not about who shot who, and that's all on the video, but it's about why, and they're just showing the facts that it's a self-defense case, and the photos show he is not murderous or had any murderous intent. They also pointed out that Kyle would have to be a member of the Proud Boys or any of the affiliations of those people. And the phone data that they had shows that they he didn't even know who any of these people were or who belonged to what group. There are laws in the area where you have to find evidence of a gang affiliation before asserting that relationship because it does affect the view of the defendant from the jury and whatnot. Also, he reminds the prosecutor that the people who shot were white and that Rosenbaum was screaming, shoot me n-word. <laughs> Even if Kyle was associated with the Proud Boys, it would only be relevant if the crime was racial, but it's a self-defense case with white people and it doesn't matter. Gage Groschkreutz, I'm gonna call him Bicep Man because I think it's funny, had drawn his gun first and was trying to shoot when Kyle shot his bicep to stop him from killing Kyle. If Kyle's intent was to purely kill, he would have just gone f directly for the lethal shot. The judge, who is incredibly based, <laughs> then dismisses the Proud Boy nonsense and the sister video because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, request, I, I think if I admitted either of these, I'd get reversed. But the, the first one, the incident involving uh, the sister, uh, this is clear in my estimation, it's a propensity evidence. Uh, it's a, it's a, an opportunity to uh, suggest to the jurors that he's acted on uh, in a violent way on other occasions and therefore he acted in a violent way on this occasion. The judge also points out that he didn't even know what the Proud Boys was and didn't want to trust any news sources to tell him who believes what. So he says that it was irrelevant because there's no evidence for it coming up in the specific thing that the trial is about. He also mentions the fact that Binger tried to introduce a Seattle article as evidence of the Proud Boys being involved when this takes place in Wisconsin. The judge also says that the white power symbol thing isn't relevant and he has never seen it in racially motivated cases so it doesn't make any sense. Binger then tries to argue with the judge that Kyle had meetings with the Proud Boys after the shooting and leg legitimately argues the proof of why it happened is that it did happen. The judge understandably says what? Based on the fact that after court in January, he goes out to Pudgies, goes down to January or uh, Miami later that month and meets with the, not only the head of the Wisconsin Proud Boys, but the head of the national Proud Boys. I think there's an inference to be drawn from that. Now the jury can be instructed what weight to give it. The defendant's actions of coming into our community illegally after curfew with a gun at the time of a protest is entirely consistent with what the Proud Boys make it their job to do. 
They even did what sounded like preparing a fake Proud Boy member like a fed to come in and scare the jury as a witness and thankfully that didn't happen. Binger tries to say that the Proud Boys bring violence to and guns to riots, as if the Proud Boys are the only ones who would do that. Antifa exists, thank you. Binger then says that Kyle's gun was bought with stimulus money, as if that proves anything? That's not illegal. Rosenbaum was convicted and sent to prison with ch like three counts of child porn, I believe. However, Kyle wouldn't have known that, so it's not necessarily a really good thing to bring up, as it would have been known at the time if it was relevant. Allegedly, Kyle heard Rosenbaum say, I just got out of jail and I'm not scared of going back. Something that would actually be reiterated by many other witnesses during the case as we go to- and I'll, I'll show you that. So it actually might be relevant to bring it into the case so the defense kind of tries to slip it in there. Also, the reporter Richard McGuinness that I brought up worked for a somewhat right-wing news media and recorded some things and then Binger doesn't like him because right wing. Remember, Rosenbaum threw his plastic bag at Kyle as Kyle went by with fire extinguisher because Rosenbaum was looking for someone to fight. Binger is really, really good at trying to talk uh, with bullshit and not actually say anything. But the other guy, Richards, basically does the same thing and gets his own shit through and it's kind of great. The prosecuting team, Binger and Glorb, were obviously trying to say that the pedos that got shot are the true victims as if they didn't rush Kyle first. It just gets blown out of the water so easily by the defense. It's honestly comical that this is in the hearing. Binger got the right-wing reporter as one of his testimony guys and is already like, wait a minute, but not everything he'll say would be true because he's a right-winger, so only listen to the things that he says that is true when it comes to my case and my side, by the way. They also got some slurs on camera that Huber, one of the guy with the skateboard, said beforehand, which also proves that he's one of the people who wanted violence and didn't care about justice or any of that nonsense. So then the judge makes Binger argue why they shouldn't admit the child molestation as evidence and he's like, we can't paint this as a shooter taking a pedo off our streets, but too late, I already did that. He kind of backpedals to extremes. Like, I agree that knowing his entire pedo history is not relevant because Kyle didn't know that at the time and we're talking about Kyle's state of mind and assessment of the the like threat that was happening. But Rosenbaum was legitimately saying that he was going to cause some sort of issues because he was out of jail and looking for a fight. So the concept is still relevant. And Kyle knew that because of the clip. He then tries to act like Rosenbaum was not doing anything wrong and was just trying to get the gun because he couldn't buy one because he's a felon. He, he legitimately says this. He's like, there's no evidence that he even wanted a gun that night at all. But, but, he, but he reached for the gun though. Sure, Your Honor. With regard to the <laughs> motive that Joseph Rosenbaum had that evening when he confronted the defendant, because that's where this really goes to, the defense wants to argue that his motivation in confronting the defendant was, among many other things, which counsels just detailed, uh, a desire to obtain the defendant's gun because Mr. Rosenbaum couldn't get the gun any legal way. That is really what this is. He's a felon, so he can't go to Dunham's or Gander Mountain and buy a gun. He's got to steal it. That's the only reason why this fact of his felony conviction could possibly come in a trial, is to show that motive. So, how plausible is that motive? First of all, we have no evidence that Joseph Rosenbaum wanted a gun that night. Second of all, counsels acknowledge everybody had guns that night. In fact, earlier in this hearing, Mr. Rosenbaum is walking up to individuals that are similarly armed to Mr. Uh, Rittenhouse, that are openly carrying AR-15 style assault rifles slung around their shoulders. He gets in their face and he is challenging them. This happens on the video. Now, does Mr. Rosenbaum at any point reach for anyone's gun? During the trial, the footage made it clear that Rosenbaum didn't care because he was either dying or going to jail anyway, so he'd rather just die, I guess. Binger legitimately says he passed a bunch of stores all night and never stole one so he didn't have intent to steal because he would have stolen from all the stores he passed. The gun just happened to float towards him and Rosenbaum decided that the gun called out to him spiritually and he had to take it. It was his cannon event officer. You are stupid. Yes, I know. That's insulting, but it's also the truth. Even the judge stops stops what they're saying. I, I love these moments when the judge is like, listen, fucko, listen. And, and he tries to make Binger admit to what he's clearly trying to say, like, be clear with your words, motherfucker. And then Binger's just like, 
No, you don't understand, Your Honor. It was just a plastic bag drifting through the wind, wanting to start again. Defense then proves that Rosenbaum had a mask and a hood and a violent mindset, and he sought to take someone out who was alone in the first place. Rittenhouse was alone. And that's kind of that. Reminder, we're not even in the actual trial yet. This is still the hearing. Binger then wanted to make Kyle's safe house public. Reminder that there are activists who genuinely want Kyle to be dead. And that's why he's in a safe house. Binger wanted the address available publicly. Why? I don't fucking know. But then he doesn't want to hand over the addresses of the witnesses to the defense team. The defense team is not, they will not take any of this information and make it public to people. That's not their job. It's just the defense in the court case. And apparently that's a safety issue. Binger then also reiterates that they need the names of the donors because if the state needed crowdfunding, you'd need the names to be public. But, but the state is entirely different when it comes to, what? How is that even remotely the same thing? Yeah, this private organization with this private guy uh, who got donations from people is definitely the same as the government. That it's a reasonable request of the defendant. He's the beneficiary of all of that fundraising. He is, uh, he is the person. It is called Free Kyle USA. He's Kyle. So this is not an independent entity. This is something, Your Honor, quite honestly, if the shoe were on the other foot and, and there was uh, some sort of fundraising for the state in this prosecution and we didn't turn that over information over, it would be per se reversible error. And he even tries to bring up Kyle called 911 when he thought some he saw a crime somewhere and that was none of his business to do. He should have just turned around and ignored it. Calling 911 makes him a snitch. What the fuck does that mean? You are a lawyer. Now he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what's what these people are doing. He's he's sitting in a car across the street. He doesn't talk to anybody. No one asks him to call 911. He thinks he sees a crime. His response in part is to call 911. His response is also to say, I wish I had my gun so I could shoot these people. Binger says lawless riots and then cannot confirm if riots classify as illegal or not. I, I love this. This is my favorite show on TV. Now we can actually go to the actual trial starting at day one. So when it comes to a court case, you're supposed to use language that is very specific. For example, you have to say alleged victim and, you know, alleged this, alleged that. So one of the things that happened was that the judge had said that when you're using the word victim, it brings a certain level of bias and for the jury, you shouldn't really be doing that. So you can use like alleged victim and other words like alleged blah blah blah, but you shouldn't just straight up call them victims. This makes total sense. It's just the way that these things operate. You have to th keep your language in a certain way and a lot of things with courts in general are nitpicking language. So it's very important. However, like I said, the media was feral, so they decided to say that the judge was biased for saying that you can't call these people victims when it was actually the opposite reason. He doesn't want to be biased, so he doesn't want to hear the word victim in this way. But to the people who were mad at Kyle Rittenhouse, they were basically also mad at the idea that you shouldn't have activists in court. This is also something that I forgot to mention in the prior part. In the footage, there was also some gunshots that did not belong to Kyle. Kyle was not the one who made those shots, and some of the shots were made by the person associated with Rosenbaum throughout the night. There's actually a breakdown that's really good from the Times of all places that shows that Kyle's innocent and did what anyone would do. So it's like when you come across someone who thinks that Kyle is some sort of racist murderer. It's quite interesting because you don't have to sit down and break down like a hundred hours of court footage like I'm doing. You can just watch the breakdown that is available from somewhere in the media that for some real miracle reason doesn't have the same vitriolic stance towards Kyle as everyone else did at that time. There is actually no excuse for being so misinformed if you have such a strong opinion on it. The self-defense is so clear and there is so much of like evidence and resources here. It's clear that the government is just being the government and using Kyle as a political example. Thank God that the judge is a good man and not an activist. Especially because the rioters and BLM can make themselves very loud, so it, it's advantageous to kind of quiet them down with a sacrificial lamb like Kyle, for instance, to stay in their favor for power and political 
political reason. The government's done this before, they'll do it again. Binger also wants the same thing. He wants his career to kind of be associated with the power that comes with the riot mob association. Even though I don't think he realizes that the mob always goes after people who they support in one way or another. That's happened since the dawn of time. Binger, in his opening statement, admitted that there was looting, rioting, and lighting of fires, and what not. Even though he refused to say it was illegal to do this in the hearing, he's also like, how many people have been to the rioting? And one lady puts up a hand in the jury because I don't think she wants to be there. <laughs> and we all know that within a short period of time after that, the community erupted in protests, looting, rioting, arson, and violence. Sunday night and Monday night. And one of the things we all agreed on yesterday is life is more important than property. But what happened as the time went on was that the people of Kenosha, who felt a sense of outrage, began to protest. But like moths to a flame, tourists from outside of our community were drawn to Chaos. Binger also asks, can we all agree that human life is more important than possessions? Which seems like such a random question, but I, I think you know where he's going with this, with the example that I brought up with the burglaries and whatnot. He also brings up EMT qualifications to try and make it seem like Kyle isn't allowed to help people during the riots because he said that he was an EMT at one point to quiet people down. Kyle also did have some basic training in a sense. Like, yes, it's not EMT level, but it's still basic enough. I have, like, incredibly basic first aid, and I have a working with children's check because of a job that I had once. That doesn't make me an EMT, but, you know, it's something. I, like, I know how to do CPR and shit like that. It's, like, an incredibly basic thing that a lot of people just have because of job requirements. But, and it, it's fine. You can still help people if you see someone who's doing that. I think it's a good thing to know basic se first aid and whatnot. Binga continues this opening statement on day two. Infrared picks up heat. He doesn't have his shirt on. So the cloth of a shirt would help conceal some of that heat, but when you don't have your shirt on, that heat radiates and the infrared picks it up more clearly. So he's very easy to see in the video as a white dot. You see him running towards the 63rd car source and behind him, running in the same direction, following him, is the defendant. Mr. Rosenbaum closes on the defendant. The defendant turns and fires four shots at Mr. Rosenbaum. As he is fallen, falling, the defendant fire, fires two more shots. One of them hits the defendant in the back, or I'm sorry, Mr. Rosenbaum in the back. And that is the shot that kills Mr. Rosenbaum. The citizens attempted to stop an unarmed shooter, so Mr. Hubert tried to bravely bash the, de the defendant's head in with his skateboard to save his community, and he dies. Then Mr. Bicep Man tries to take out the shooter and gets shot. He didn't do nothing. He shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum, an unarmed man. The shot that killed Mr. Rosenbaum was a shot to the back. This occurred after the defendant chased down Mr. Rosenbaum. They, one person hits him in the back of the head, one person takes a swing at him with a skateboard. That individual is Anthony Huber. He also says that Bicep Man raises his hands with his gun as an act of saying that he won't shoot, and then omits the fact that Bicep Guy immediately tried to shoot Kyle, and that is why Kyle responded with shooting him. How long are we into this thing and there's already so many lies? He also says that Kenosha was attracting outsiders who didn't belong to the protests, who were making shit their own business when it was none of their business, and Kyle was one of these busy, sticky beaks, and he decided that property is more valuable than human life even though he, he didn't do that at all. He also says that the only person who killed anyone was Kyle, so Kyle is the bad guy because no one else even resorted to murder, even though I mentioned that no one had any idea that Kyle had done anything until he himself turned himself in, so just how many people had died that we don't know about because the people who did it didn't say that they did. I, I bring that to you. He brings up that Kyle can't legally own a gun even though the statute that we talked about about play comes into play here. He then brings up that the protesters passed Kyle's group so many times that night and they were hostile to each other but nothing happened so Kyle is the one that escalated everything. The police decide to move the line of protesters south on Sheridan and eventually they pass the car source at 59th and Sheridan. The police establish a line at 60th and Sheridan, one block south. Now, as that process is going on, many of these protesters pass by the defendant. 
and the people that he's with at 59th Street. Words are exchanged. There is confrontation. There is a little bit of hostility. No one is hurt. No one fires a gun. Which is a weird statement to me, because how do you know it's the same group of people? There, there are so many different groups of people that get attracted to a night of chaos. So how do you know that the groups that didn't actually do anything were the same people who did? How do you know that it's Kyle's fault here? How do you know that? At one point, a group of rioters had dragged a dumpster out of the car source property and tried to light it on fire. And this fucko says, if Kyle ventures out into the protest groups, he won't be treated well. And then he says, Kyle went out after the protesters once his property was clear and no one was attacking his property anymore. As if Kyle went out into the night looking for a fight and had known completely that he was going to get like someone was going to try and kill him. He also mentions that Rosenbaum had been discharged from the hospital and was just hanging out with his girlfriend and he got caught up in the protest and was carrying his little hospital bag. He was such an angel. And he was only 5'3". He was a manlet, so even if he was going around lighting fires and provoking armed people all day and trying to attack people and swearing at people and using racial slurs at a riot, no one shot him but Kyle did because Kyle is an evil killer. The only thing that Rosenbaum did was try to take his gun and shoot him, so that that's no reason to kill someone. Mr. Rosenbaum had been discharged from the hospital that very day and had come back to his home of Kenosha had met up with his girlfriend, Carrie Ann Swart. He couldn't stay with her, so he left her and came downtown and got caught up in the midst of these protests. <laughs> he is carrying a plastic bag. Part of that plastic bag is clear and see-through. It has a string, white string, drawstring to it. It is the type of bag, I believe the evidence will show, that you get at the hospital when you're asked to put all of your personal possessions in a bag. Who are similarly armed as the defendant, who have similar AR-15 type rifles on, and he is literally confronting them in their faces. None of those folks shoot him. They push him away. He's five foot three, by the way. He then brings up that Rosenbaum was walking, and Kyle was also walking in the same direction that is behind Rosenbaum, that Kyle was chasing him down like an animal to shoot him. Kyle is running in the same direction of Rosenbaum because the car source is on fire and Kyle is trying to run towards it with a fire extinguisher. Rosenbaum is running around there because he was also lighting fires. <laughs> he was provoking so many people that someone about 30 feet away actually fired a warning shot. Now, before we keep going, there is going to be several points in this where Binger tries to bring up that somehow firing a shot directly into the air as a warning is somehow a good thing to do. I'm going to put this opinion right out there. You can you can tell me all you want what you think, but firing a shot into the air is retarded. If you fire a shot into the air, it goes up. You don't know where it's going to go when it lands. F that one fat, fat fucko boogie. He fired a warning shot and he like hit a bird because the bullet came down somewhere. A human could have been standing there. You don't just fire aimlessly like that. That's retarded. If you're gonna do something in self-defense, you don't just fire like a pussy shot in the air. That's not how that shit works. But, but mark my words, mark my words, Binger will bring this back even though it is stupid, stupid. You are stupid. He says that since Rosenbaum's first wounds were in the legs, and then Kyle kept shooting, it makes it seem like like Rosenbaum was lying on the floor with his legs bleeding and then Kyle was like standing over him contemplating where to shoot him next and it was like this long drawn out thing. But if you think about what actually happened, it all happened in less than a second, right? Each shot happened in less than a second. And the fact that he was shot in the legs first, made, to me, makes it seem like Kyle doesn't want to kill him. Again, with Bicep Man, he got shot in the bicep because Kyle didn't want to kill him. If Kyle, Kyle wanted to kill him, shoot him somewhere else, you know? Now, because Rosenbaum fell over, his body was kind of flailing around. So the last of Kyle's shots shot him in the back. But it was not intended to be that way. Rosenbaum was not intended to have been shot in the back like that. Because when I say shot in the back, technically it's true, but it's actually a very misleading way to say it because it makes it sound like Rosenbaum had turned around and then Kyle had cowardly acted in this way. Obviously uses this to his advantage because he's a slimy little rat thing. Binger's next point is that the reporter sent Rosenbaum into the ambulance to try and save his life, Richard McGuinness, but that Kyle didn't do that. Because if someone is trying to kill you and you act in self-defense as a 17-year-old who is in a state of panic, 
you're supposed to then immediately try and save that person's life, I suppose. He says that Kyle is trying to be a medic, and a real medic would try and save a murderous psychopath who tries to kill you, even though you're in a state of shock because you're a, you're a fucking minor. The crowd also saw Kyle as an active shooter. Now, obviously, yes, I, you can see why, because he shot someone, but the crowd doesn't know the context. The crowd fo forms a mob because the crowd is in a frenzy. Kyle is trying to run away from them. He's clearly not shooting at them because he doesn't want to shoot people when it's not necessary. He is running away from them to not only save his life, but to also try and get to the police to turn himself in. Who cares what the crowd thinks? Who cares what the crowd thinks? They don't know anything. We'll hear about Anthony Huber you will hear that he was a skateboarder, that he lived for skateboarding, that he was at the skate park at Neuer Park all the time, that he actually knew Jacob Blake personally, that he came out that night because he wanted to show support for his friend, Jacob Blake. You will hear what sort of person Anthony Huber was. You know, Hubert was a cute little skateboarder who wanted to support his friend Blake. He didn't do anything wrong. He, he didn't go to jail for trying to beat up women. I don't know what this fucko's name is. This guy in the background is so big that his stomach is sitting above the surface of the tabletop as if it's also watching the court proceedings. I've never seen anything like this and I keep forgetting his name. They've said his name a couple times but I, I never catch it so I, that's why I'm calling him Glorb by the way. The defendant stands up and he seems like a really nice guy. He seems cool but throughout the entire trial he stumbles around a lot when he talks so it's like the other guy seems more confident and he's like a better speaker than this guy Richards. He does immediately say that this isn't Kyle shooting or not shooting, it's about the reason why the gun was shot, which I think is an important point to bring up first. And he focuses on self-defense, it's abundantly clear why this was done. He plays footage of Rosenbaum saying, you know, things. The gas station where he was shouting, shoot me nigger, shoot me nigger. I think that Richard quoted the shoot me nigger thing because he was waiting to try and drop that end bomb and you know what, I would do the same thing, man. He also brings up that Kyle specifically stated that he wanted to turn himself into the police. This is something that was known, he did this. The entire case existed because he did this. And he was horrified at this. He was horrified at the idea of shooting someone. But the mob doesn't care because they're a mob, they don't know what the context is, all they wanted was blood. Richard also goes over how horrible Hubert was trying to decapitate Kyle with a skateboard which is something that it can cause grievous harm. It's a skateboard against a human neck. If you don't think that that's something that can be a serious issue, you need to get your head checked as well. Hubert and Rosenbaum also knew each other and at certain points in the night, Hubert was trying to hold Rosenbaum back from attacking random people. He also corrects Binger. The man who Binger described as flying through the air above Kyle while Kyle was on the ground was actually actively kicking Kyle in the face. He's known as Jump Kick Man and he was the man that was not identified. The prosecutor did not play footage during his opening statement. I don't know enough about court trials in general to know if this is a good or a bad idea. I guess it's dependent on the context. But the defendant does play a lot of video. He also clarifies that Rosenbaum said, if I get either of you two alone, I'm going to kill you, from a prior altercation where he had yelled some things at Kyle's group. There are also very, very crystal clear videos and footage where Rosenbaum was grabbing for the gun. Kyle runs towards the police to try and get help, not away from the police to escape justice. Richards always ex also explains many examples that show Kyle on video not pulling his gun because the people who were trying to fuck with him backed off because they didn't want to be shot. He only pulled his gun when someone else was trying to pull it first. He also reveals that Bicep Man lied to the cops that he was unarmed when he interacted with Kyle. This is something that was also brought up later with documents to match, and Bicep Guy admits to it. The cops told Kyle to go home and Kyle tried to go to them on multiple occasions, but Kyle still did his best to try and get himself turned in because he did not want to shoot people, and this is abundantly clear, especially from any of the detectives that were there as well. With the opening statements out of the way, we then go to the first witness, Dominic Black, Kyle's friend, who had bought the gun. He begins his story saying that he and Kyle would go hunting sometimes and he went hunting with his family a lot, so this was kind of a normal occurrence. For the gun, Black had gone to the store for a clay pigeon and ammo, and Kyle had brought up that he also wanted a gun and to see if there was a way that he could, you know, use it but not own it since he's underage. They then come up with the idea to have the gun in Dominic's family's name so that Kyle could not actually legally own it until he was 18 and everything is still ethical. 
He said that he would only do it if Kyle wouldn't have the gun anyway because he didn't want a sort of underage ownership kind of situation. Afterwards, they used the guns to shoot clay pigeons on the range and the property. This is all fairly straightforward. Now, a weird thing about this is, even though this is Kyle's friend, he was brought up as one of Binger's witnesses. And if you're thinking this is weird, I agree with you. But there's something in particular about this that will come up later, just trust me on this. Binger then makes a big old show of evidence being not handled in a way that is harmful in the courtroom, like he's trying to do a trigger warning to show guns to people in the courtroom in case they get scared. Now obviously that makes sense, you want to handle things in the courtroom in a way that does not like directly have a gun in line of sight of the jury or whatnot, but keep this in mind, he kind of does it overly cautious, like things with laser pointers and his little, you know, wooden pointer that he gets afterwards and stuff like that. He's making a very, very conscious effort in the sense that he wants you to notice that he's doing that. I really want you to remember it, I'll remind you later, but remember that Binger thinks that putting a gun at the jury is a bad thing. For safety purposes, but I'm going to have them hold them up and show them to you and I'm going to ask you if you can identify them for us, okay? Okay. And I want to represent to everyone that these uh, items are not loaded. There are no bullets or anything like that. And it's kind of funny how the guy in the back is trying to assemble the gun and it fails, so like the camera turns away. Dominic was also showed a scope and didn't recognize it, so it must have been Kyle's scope. And he had a project to try and make up a gun, building it because his family did that kind of stuff, which, again, is kind of made out to be a bad thing, but it, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's perfectly fine. They also show Kyle's TikTok that shows Kyle with a gun and the hilarious username because they really wanted to show the TikTok as like some sort of weird thing against him when it just looks like he's like a funny teenager. They also asked why Kyle didn't take the gun from the father's safe and they have to explain to Binger that yes, it, it is perfectly fine to have a gun that you can have a 17 year old use under supervision but you can't actually have them own it, Binger. Dad had took a lot of the weapons we had out of the safe due to all the rioting and uh, stashed them inside the house in case somebody were to come break into our house. When did you first see the defendant with that weapon that day? Um, when I was in the kitchen. On that day, Dominic Black's dad took the guns out of the garage safe and left them in the house in case rioters tried to break in. I don't know why, because I would have thought that they were safer in the safe, but that's what he did, and that's how Kyle was able to access that gun. A few hours before they left to the car lot car source, Dominic saw that Kyle w had taken the gun and started looking for medical supplies to pack and take with him in case anyone needed help. He says that every car was burned up severely in the first car lot location. Afterwards, they went home and then they went to get their guns and Kyle got his medical supplies, like I said. Basically, the three guys went to clean up the graffiti and then they went home, got their supplies, bought slings for the guns and met the owner of the car lot, Sam. They met Sam twice that day, the second time being when they were arranging to actually go and set up in the car source. They exchanged numbers that first time in case Sam needed any help. He and Kyle had been assigned to one location and the other people were defending the other locations. Dominic was one of the people on the roof, like a roof Korean while Kyle was doing his medic thing below. Police had begun pushing the rioters back to control the crowd so the rioters were coming closer and closer to the car area. They were all extremely angry, as you can imagine, they were fighting and throwing things. The people hiding in the shadows in the construction sites across the road were looking very suspicious, so the group all aimed their guns out of, you know, a sense of protection and deterrent and told the shadowy figure to get up and get out of there. They were obviously hiding. Um, it was pitch black outside. We couldn't see anything besides a lot of shadows hiding behind the rocks. What action, if any, did you and the other members of your group take as a result of seeing those people hiding? We all started yelling, telling them to stop hiding and to go away. What exactly did you do with your gun? We had aimed them. You would point your gun at those people? In the direction. So, contrary to Binger's argument, other people were threatened enough by the rioters to use their guns. The other car source was being attacked, so that's when Dominic called Kyle to tell him about the fire. And since Kyle was on the ground at that point and using his medical bag, he ran off in that direction. The last that Dominic heard was gunshots, but he didn't see anything. He then gets a call from Kyle about the shooting, and then Kyle hangs up immediately after stating the things that he did, and then Dominic sees Kyle back at the original car source lot, freaking out. 
Kyle wanted to turn himself in immediately, but they couldn't do it in Kenosha because the rioters had blocked the police station, so they took him home and told him to turn himself in the next day. Only now does Binger say that you have the right to remain silent because you're being charged with giving a minor a gun. Should have opened up with that, maybe? Have I not personally drafted a criminal complaint against you, charging you with two felony counts of providing that gun to the defendant, which were used to kill two separate people? Is that correct? Yes. And that is a case, a criminal case, that I'm prosecuting that is you that is still pending. Is that right? Yes. As a criminal defendant in that case, are you aware of the fact that you have a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent and not answer any questions about any of that? Binger also keeps saying, well, you didn't feel threatened, so you didn't shoot anyone, right? To Dominic, ignoring the fact that Dominic is safe on the roof the entire time and Kyle is the one who's on the ground in a throng of people, a few of which actually physically assaulted him, including hitting him with a skateboard in the head, kicking him in the face when he was on the ground to curb stomp him. All of this just works. During the cross-examination, it's revealed some additional details, as cross-examinations often do. Dominic met with Binger to testify under the guise that Binger would be more lenient on him for his own charges. And Dominic confirms that he wasn't aware that the defense had also asked to meet with him, so he never met with the defense. You had given Kyle the gun, correct? Yes. And you talked to your girlfriend, his sister, at the police department and asked about coming up with a story to protect you regarding the guns, correct? I don't, I do not remember that. If she said it happened, you would disagree, correct? I would disagree. Dominic knew he'd be in trouble for the gun thing, so apparently Kyle's sister said that Dominic should try and come up with some sort of story. Dominic very awkwardly says, no, that didn't happen. One of the people in the group had a laser pointer at one point in the night, and the rioters got really angry and thought it was a weapon. So Dominic told him to stop doing it, but that person kept doing it anyway. Dominic didn't personally know this guy either, it was just one of the other random people who had shown up that night. Detective Antaramian, the only person I saw actually help people was Kyle. Yes. The next is this influencer guy called Corey Washington. He was doing a Facebook Live recording because he's some stupid influencer. He said he, he's one of the most insufferable people to listen to. Listen, I'm sure that guy's he's great in real life, but he talks so much and says nothing, and it's like the longest, most excruciating thing ever. Anyways, he says he saw a lot of violence and people in the area were coming into the area from outside to cause violence. Uh, he just talks so much, man. Binger also plays the video that this guy took for his Facebook live stream and says, well, you didn't see anyone shoot anyone or anything, right? Even though Rosenbaum was there, no one shot him, so he didn't do anything, right? And it's like, what point are you trying to make? The videos also go on for so long, like Binger plays straight up, plays like a 10 minute to 15 minute video, the entirety of it, and you just have to sit there and watch it like five times. Why are you playing the entire, entire Dark Knight trilogy in this court case? Why didn't you cut it down a little bit? The feds had an HD copy of this drone footage and they did didn't want to give it to the court for some reason. The government is just withholding evidence so that they could be able to just put Kyle in jail. Why would they hide it unless it proves something and Kyle is innocent? They also completely blacked out his, the identity of the Fed who came in to talk about this. He, he could have been shown like everyone else, there was no reason to black out the identity of this Fed. You can also see his name in the articles that were reporting on it, so it's not like they, they were trying to make him anonymous everywhere. Why, why was this happening? We aren't at liberty to know what the government knows in this publicly recorded case that they're trying to use to send a kid to jail for defending himself. There could be a lot of reasons for this, but personally, now this might be a bit of a conspiracy theory, but whatever. I think that maybe they didn't want to show the HD footage because they don't want the public to know how good quality they have in terms of drone footage. Because the thing is, whenever we get like a technological upgrade, the military and the government has always had the same thing for years, but the public is just seeing it as some new invention, right? What if like, you know, partially it's because they want to send Kyle to jail for their own reasons, but also because they don't want the public to know that they might have some sort of like video technology that is like way clearer than we know exists in the world, in public, yet. Yeah, I don't know, maybe. You can call me a crackpot if you want to, I just wonder. But the way that they present it in, in trial, it just makes it sound like, hey, like, 
my dad works at Nintendo, so he's right and you're wrong. And we got rid of the video proof because you're not allowed to see because you have cooties and you're not cool enough. And then the judge told Binger to skip the Fed's footage because there's too many smoke and mirrors. Rightfully so, this judge is fantastic. But like, back, back, I keep getting distracted because Mr. Washington over here is like really boring. Anyway, Corey was out past curfew, but the, the way he talks as well, he's just like, well, maybe I was out curfew, but then maybe, perhaps, yes, but perhaps there was a chance that maybe not, or maybe, yes, maybe, perhaps. And it's like, uh, commit, commit. On day three, Corey comes back in. I, I wish I wish that wasn't the case. He mentions that he heard something about people saying that Kyle was going on about shooting black people or something. It's all like, well, I heard another guy say that another guy said that this thing happened. He comes across as incredibly mindful about what people on social media are going to say about him, which I guess makes sense if he's trying to be an influencer, right? Anyways, once we're finally done with that excruciating ordeal, this police officer shows up. You are stupid. Yes, I know. That's insulting, but it's also the truth. So they establish with this police officer that he was in Kenosha that night and that there was a suggested curfew in place. So it wasn't like a law thing. It was just like the detective said that there was a curfew and sent alerts to people, but no one listened to it. And it wasn't actually like a big thing that was enforced. This officer and another detective were in charge of the case because Dominic and Kyle went in to talk to them the morning after the event. This guy was in charge charge of social media so he did important things like twitter searches <laughs> and watched videos on the internet i wonder if he used youtube dl if i took ad read sponsorships this is a great time to be a, go to like a vpn sponsorship but i don't do them so i'm just gonna show a picture of tub tub on the screen for a little while binga named one of his video evidence files militia footage and paused over and over again to hover his mouse over the name frequently to instill in your mind that kyle is part of a militia as word association, which is a very dirty trick. This is a point of contention if the boys counted as a militia or not, which is part of like the whole they're white supremacist type of angle because even though they're clearly just like a, a bunch of boys, calling them a, a, an armed militia has its sort of... Uh, associations. The video itself also has commentary from a guy who was not currently supposed to be testifying in court, so it should have been objected to because there was no way it could be there with a, with this guy's commentary. And yes, he does get added later on as a, a witness in the thing, which doesn't make sense because nothing he's saying is relevant, but I guess they just did that so that they could keep this commentary in. The, the defense, I get that part of what they're doing is just letting the lies be said so that they can correct the lies, but sometimes it's really annoying because especially when I was watching over certain clips that had lawyers commentating on it and all of them were screaming like, object, object to this, object, like over and over again. It gives you this like sense of urgency when you're watching it, like what the fuck? <laughs> At certain points, including this point now, the judge has to step in and basically object for the defense. In this case, the judge says that this is not a good thing to put into the trial, and Binger starts arguing. Binger argues every single time. It's so funny. It's not for testimony <laughs> purposes, but I want the jury to hear it. Law enforcement is not a report for the purposes of reporting a crime or for any pending legal action whatsoever. He's That's making, right. Let's okay, talk about this confrontation. Let's talk about it as you're saying. Then it goes to the defendant's state of mind. No, it does not. How? How? How about it? Let me explain that. He is witnessing what's going on in the crowd. He's witnessing the response. He's witnessing all of these statements that are being made. Where? Where's the defendant? And it goes to his state of mind. You are stupid. Binger legitimately thinks that this random commentary is going to prove Kyle's unreasonable state of mind. The guy just said, I heard somebody said somebody shot somebody. And it's like, wow, what, what great evidence you have. My goodness. They bring up the body cam footage from another cop and it's just people screaming. The majority of the videos that you'll see in this case are pure, like, what, what am I looking for? Like filler? It's just filler. It's just videos somewhere else of a bunch of people screaming during a riot and it's like this is really boring. <laughs> Kyle says on one of the videos that he doesn't have any non-lethal defenses for himself, only the gun. Citizens, and I just got pepper sprayed by a person in the crowd. So you had non-lethal, but you didn't respond. We don't have non-lethal. So you guys are full on ready to defend the property. Yes, we are. No, if I can ask, can you guys step back? Medical EMS right here. I'm an EMP. Need a medic. I'm and this is on Richie McGuinness's video, the guy interviewing Kyle doing his medical stuff, and he was talking about de-escalating the church situation, which 
refers to this point where people, including Rosenbaum, by the way, were trying to light a church on fire and basically attacking people around it. And this video actually shows that Kyle was genuinely trying to talk people down from doing violent acts and he helped with the church situation put, to put out the fire. Also, something that technically wasn't brought up in the trial properly that I'm still hung up on is in this piece of footage, Kyle doesn't claim himself to be an EMT. Well, he's an EMT, and I'm, gotcha. just, I'm just kind of protecting the ass. Oh, so you're a certified EMT? Yeah. Gotcha. And do you work as an EMT normally? His friend answers for him and then Kyle says something like, I have some training or something. He doesn't say he's an EMT. But even later on, they'll be like, did you admit that you were an EMT? Did you lie that you were an EMT? And Kyle was like, yeah, I did, sorry. And it's like, you, you didn't though. And no one ever brings it up. No, no, none of the lawyers, no one catches that on the video, but it's clearly there on the video that Kyle didn't say he was an EMT. I don't know, man, maybe I just don't know anything. This guy is known as Yellow Pants Guy. He is one of the guys that was um, like saying some violent things, but he wasn't really doing anything. He was under the false impression that Kyle was like some white supremacist shooter because he kind of saw or heard certain things, but he was part of the mob so he doesn't actually know what's happening. On the video, he starts describing things that Kyle was doing, but this guy wasn't there for the testimony either, so I don't know why this is allowed in court, but the defense didn't object to it, so it's just there. I don't see what the point of half of these clips are besides making the defense's job easier. <laughs> you can actually see Kyle start to go check on the person that he shot, despite Binger saying that he never did, but then Binger cuts the video and changes it to another video because he doesn't want you to see that part. They also ask this guy where the other shots came from that weren't from Kyle, and there's no way he could know that from the video, but he's like, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe here? And it's like, okay, are you just guessing? Why is this in court? They then show the windows bar over the video so no one can see it. I think this is a, a brilliant tactic from the TV. <laughs> they then show footage of Rosenbaum dead and people trying to help the, him by like putting his shirt on the blood wound coming from his head. They're basically showing Kyle being chased by an angry mob of crazy people as he's running as well. Again, I don't know why this is some helping the prosecution at all. The old video also clearly shows that Kyle is running to the cops with his arms raised to turn himself in, but they turn him away. Does this on me? useless commentary of explaining that we're, we're watching things that are happening and it's like i don't need you to tell me that it's it's like a reaction youtuber it's like jinx uh, drinks you really load which is a really funny name considering the topic we're talking about so then during the cross-examination the defense is talking about like the the thing that they do when there's like a witness and a suspect and stuff like that and you have to get all the data from their phones to see if they're not hiding anything. He did not download any of the information on the bicep guy's phone because of Binger's concerns and his concerns weren't valid. He's basically just bringing up that he has concerns. He doesn't want all of like the shady shit that bicep guy was involved in to be shown in court. And frustratingly enough, it worked and the cops did not search Bicep Guy's phone. He also initially denies that he interviewed Dominic as well, which is very shady. But he also confirms that the Bicep Guy was the only one he f refuses to collect the phone information from, but he did collect it from other people. It, it, again, it's very shady. He also said that he used a stopwatch to determine the shot time, like, you know, between the four shots that Rosenbaum took and stuff like that, when there are computer tools for that that have a way more accurate way of doing that, and these have been in place for years. So it's a bit shaky that I used a stopwatch. He's then asked if he let someone go in exchange for them sharing social media recordings of the event on his phone, and he can't even answer the question, which means he did. He was located, past curfew, taken into custody, and brought him to the police department. You already said you can't arrest for that. You just send him home. He, when he was arrested, yep. he had marijuana yep. with this person, correct? Correct. You have no ability to make promises or give consideration for cooperation, correct? We wanted the video yes or no. than to cite him for curfew. Just yes or non responsive. Who did you get permission from to not charge him with the marijuana? I don't recall getting permission. I made it's been a decision that detective been answering me that I made. Okay. I don't recall getting permission for that. That may have been a decision that detective answering me and I made. But he doesn't have the authority to. Yeah, he just you, said he can't do it. But I, that evening, I our maid lead detective along with Detective Antoramio on this case. He also admits that Rosenbaum was chasing Kyle despite being warned with a gun and a clear vocal exchange. 
On day 4, it starts with a redirect where Binger plays more boring, useless videos that don't actually matter. We then get to Richie McGuinness, the guy who was interviewing Kyle. He actually said that he carries cigarettes and white claws to calm down rioters during his interviews as like offerings to gremlins, and it actually works. What a legend. Can you help us understand what it was about these four individuals who, by the way, all four of them are black, correct? Mm -hmm. Um, well, the way that the one stepped out on me, it was like he, he was presenting the rocks as if he was ready to smash my head. Um, and he stepped out in my direction, at which point I kind of took one step back. Um, and in, th in those kind of situations, I was trying to keep my distance. Demeanor so change? I put my phone down and then I told him I'm not recording. I just want to know what happened. And his demeanor did not change. Um, and he still had the rocks in his hands uh, as if he was ready to hit me. And so then I said, hey guys, um, let's take a step back here for a second. Does anyone wanna, um, I generally carry like cigarettes and white claws to, uh, <laughs> to use in these kind of situations. Um, it's like a tactic, you know, people are always really angry in these in these. I'll pacify the blacks with cigarettes and white claws. What could go wrong? So in your experience uh, in these types of crowds, you have experienced... <laughs> he confirms that Rosenbaum lunged for the rifle from Kyle, which, you know, he witnessed it, so it makes sense. He's also confused because he's unfamiliar with the heat vision video and they're just showing it to him without establishing any foundation. Like during the depth trial, there were times when they had to ask, are you familiar with this? Have you seen this piece of media before? I, do you know what this is? And stuff like that. And the times that the Amber Heard's lawyers forgot to say that, they were reprimanded because the person who was testifying hadn't seen those materials before and it was very confused by it. The same thing happens here. I don't know. I don't know what the point of this is. Binger also keeps trying to get McGinnis to say that Kyle shot Rosenbaum while Rosenbaum was falling down to try and act like Kyle had shot a fallen man in a coward manner, and McGuinness has to keep clarifying that there were four shots. So which shot are you talking about? Like, there are four shots in distinct locations. You can't just say shot and not clarify which one you're talking about. I'm seeing some other videos before you gave this interview to Tucker Carlson. So you'd watch some things in those three days, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. But in this video here, uh, you are telling uh, Fox News, Tucker mm -hmm. Carlson, that the defendant shot Mr. Rosenbaum as Mr. Rosenbaum was falling forward, correct? Um, yeah, it's unclear to me because the shots were so quick uh, uh, whether, you know, the shots are the reason why he, perhaps it was the shots that caused him to then, rather than stopping himself, um, just fall flat. That's not what you just said. Let's play this back about 20 seconds, please. And Rittenhouse actually took the barrel of the rifle and just dodged around. And at that point, as Rosenbaum was falling forward, he fired quickly four shots into Rosenbaum. And Your interview three days after this incident says that Mr. Rosenbaum was already falling forward when the defendant used the gun and discharged the shots. I, I, I don't I, see why I, that's inconsistent with what I'm saying right now. He was he was lunging, falling. Um, I would use those as synonymous terms in this situation. Rosenbaum wasn't falling at first. He only started rebalancing himself because he missed when he was lunging for the gun and he was grabbing it again. McGuinness had used the word menacing describing the situation that had occurred during one of the interviews after the event and not the guns or the people or Kyle himself. Yet this had to be clarified because Binger is a slimy little slimy slime. But the defense misses the mark so hard that even they started talking about how you said that these things were menacing, but you didn't really mean that Kyle was menacing, did you? And then, then McGinnis is like, I said the situation was menacing. Like, did you did you pay attention? Did you watch the thing? You had interviewed Kyle before this shooting, maybe fifteen minutes. It was like fourteen. Ed, when you met Kyle and you interviewed him, he was not <clears throat> menacing to you, was he? Um beyond that he had a weapon, no. Okay, so what was menacing was the weapon. When I when I said um, menacing in that context, it was the situation that was menacing. Binger is like, this is so funny. Binger is like, McGinnis, you don't know fucking anything. And, and McGinnis is like, but Rosenbaum was reaching for the gun. <laughs> With me that, that you've given us your, your impressions of that? Yes. At any point, 
did you hear Mr. Rosenbaum say anything about the defendant's gun? I did not know. He never said, I want your gun. I'm going to take your gun. You don't know, as you sit here today, what Mr. Rosenbaum was thinking, do you? You mean at the time of the shooting? Yes. Or at any point in his life. I mean, you have no idea what Mr. Rosenbaum was ever thinking on those lines. is complete guesswork, isn't it? Um, well, he said, fuck you, and then he reached for the weapon. <laughs> This is one of Kyle's friends, Nick Balch, the guy who was with Kyle and Dominic. Like a third of the way through the testimony, the courtroom camera starts being fucking haunted by a ghost. I don't know what this is. I can't do anything about it. Binger asks Balch if he could use his gun at rioters damaging his property. Like, would you shoot people over property? Do you really think that property is worth more than someone's lives? And Balch says, no, I'd only really use it if someone was attacking me or uh, my friends. Binger is r really trying to set it up like Kyle would use his gun against people who were like doing things to property, which is a completely false narrative. Kyle was not protecting property when Huber was smashing his face in. He was protecting himself. Interestingly, Balch says that Kyle actually seemed under-equipped and under-experienced, which makes sense because he's 17 and Balch has military experience. He was also said that they were told someone fitting Rosenbaum's description was trying to light the church on fire, something that several witnesses will reiterate. Bicep was constantly with his finger on the trigger, so Balch says that he had poor discipline when he saw him and could have accidentally shot someone just by his finger being nudged, because one of the big rules about firearms is you can't point your gun at something without being willing to shoot it, because it's very important. The discipline that you need to, to know about and practice when you use a firearm is very important, obviously, but for someone who is a, like a violent white supremacist murderer, Kyle seems to genuinely try really hard with his discipline, but the people around him who were trying to kill him didn't really seem to do the same thing. Then on the cross-examination, Binger brings up that Rosenbaum is a manlet, so he wasn't a threat to anyone, and tries to stop Balch from testifying that he did see Rosenbaum attempt to hurt people, because that sounds bad. Rosenbaum was right there in front of my face, yelling and screaming. And I would say, dude, back up, just chill. I don't know what your problem is. And he goes, you know what? If I catch any of you guys alone tonight, I'm going to fucking kill you. Rosenbaum, again, another person says, if I catch any of you tonight, I'm going to kill you. Something that a lot of the witnesses say that they heard. On the fifth day, we get Lekowski, another person who was there. <laughs> Once again, we get the Rosenbaum manless argument again. You'll see this so many times and it's just It's like, oh, he's just a Chucky doll running after you. He can't do anything. Just let him tire himself out Then he'll go to bed. Lakowski is kind of slimy like with a convenient memory He admits that he would feel a threat on his life if Rosenbaum had done what he did to Kyle though so like even even though it's him trying to be slimy for the defense it's also like well so then glorb decides to talk to the witnesses we get amber the dna analyst who is useless they just brought her up because she said that um she did the dna swabs of the guns and she didn't find rosenbaum's handprint on the gun so they were like well if his handprint isn't on the gun it means that he couldn't have grabbed it because that means his fingerprints would have been on the gun even though he does it on video and then during cross they just pull up the fucking pictures that they have of him openly doing this and then she's like y yeah i agree that he did that <laughs> it's like what are you here then Rosenbaum's girlfriend is a drug addict looking person. She says that she and him met when they were homeless. He has to go to the mental hospital. He has like bipolar and shit like that. And they stayed at a motel that they lived out of once they stopped being like super homeless. She told him to be careful that night when he went out to the riots with this little plastic hospital bag. And then she heard what happened and got all sad. She even says that she went to the place that he died the next day and put her hand on his blood on the ground and she carried the wet blood in her hand, despite the fact that the blood would have dried overnight. But nice try, lady. The Facebook I don't know. Kenosha scanner page to see what what the police call might have been about that night. And um, there was a video link, and I clicked that, and that's when I saw the video of Joe dying. So you watched one of the videos of the shooting? Correct. And uh, that evening, had you been watching uh, we've heard a lot of people are out there live streaming or filming or the news. Did, did you been watching any of that? Nothing. All right. So you had no idea that 
uh, anything. You, you didn't know what was happening in downtown Kenosha until four o'clock. Until four morning. in the morning. Once you saw that video, what did you do? I broke down, and I can't get that image out of my head. So, yeah. Did you go down to downtown Kenosha at all? I did the following morning. My sister picked me up about 8 a.m. and we went over to Car Source and there was the mark where Joe had been uh, laying. And I put my hand in it and my hand was wet with his blood. She also says like, oh, I don't remember any of the, the medication that he was on besides one medication. And then she remembers more than one when she's conveniently asked about it. This other guy used to work at the dealer. He's also very confused. He doesn't really understand why he's here. There's no reason to have this guy as a witness because all it does for Binger is to establish that the rioters were so violent and dangerous that this guy was scared as an employee and a business owner for a different business that wasn't car source. He also says that he thought Kyle's group was cool. So when he went over to see what was up, he asked for a picture as well. And he didn't feel threatened by them at all. His brother is Sam, who is actually like the, the owner person, and he really didn't want to say that they hired unofficial security in the form of like a bunch of dudes with guns, but he's kind of forced to say it on the stand, that's really funny. Then we get one of the bald officers, Officer Eric. He says that it took them three days to collect the shells and process the damn scene. Three days to collect the shells? Then it's like, it's like Binger is stuck on whether or not the shooting happened or not, rather than the reasons why. Like, like the defense said, we know it happened. We're not talking about whether it happened, we're talking about why it happened. You brought this cop for what? He's just confirming that a shooting happened. Even Glorb admits that there were other shootings going on that night. They also bring up another cop afterwards for the same information. He looks like the same guy, like they're both made with the same things in Lego Island. Then they interview the guy who responded to Bicep and escorted him out of the scene in an ambulance. He says that there was constant gunfire, so it wasn't like Rittenhouse was the only guy who had a gun or was the big scary. Glorb really doesn't like what some of these people are saying and he has to make that known. The name of Giovanni Garcia, uh, he was very panicked. He was in a hospital room and he kept stating that he wanted to leave. Uh, that's, we don't need... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't say that! On day 7, Bicep Man finally testifies. They first ask if he was convicted of a crime and then move on without asking what it is, knowing that the defense is definitely going to jump on that, so that's really funny. They try to establish him as a little angel who did nothing wrong by talking about how he's an EMT who helps people and has trained for it since he was a teen. He also says that he didn't actually work as a proper EMT, he was just ferrying people between private healthcare businesses, which is not an, an ambulance thing. He says that one of the scariest things that happened to him when he was training to be a superhero in the health sphere was he saw someone get shot once and he sounds like he's going to cry and starts making it out like he's knowledgeable on the subject more than he actually is. Gunshots can be very traumatic uh, and I mean traumatic in the sense of the, the physiology of what it can do to the body. Obviously there are you know numerous factors that come into it, the size of the, the caliber, where the person's shot, how many times. Um, and when you are practicing in school, it is much different from when you actually go and put your hands on somebody who is, is bleeding. Um, there's <laughs> lots of blood, um, screaming. He's like, oh, it's so scary and horrible to shoot someone. Like, why did you do it then? He starts to finally describe the protests and tries to undermine the amount of violence that happened. It's clear that he was there for a political reason and he's like having that with him and viewing it through that political lens rather than the truth. His description of the riot sounds way different from everyone else who was there and way different from the footage as well. He then hears someone screaming medic, so he goes to help a patient who tripped over. So he walked around more to help people with a game plan, like that sounds kind of similar to Kyle's. He sounds very rehearsed, which, you know, I, I, I get it. You have to prep people who are on the stand. He, the way he keeps looking at the jury reminds me of Amber Heard so much. Binger then asks if Bicep would have treated people regardless of political leaning and he said yes, even though I don't believe that. Bicep Man admits that there was a propensity of violence in the riots. That's very bad for Binger. <laughs> we were all aware of what was happening in the days following Jacob Blake's shooting. Um, People do have a right to demonstrate. 
uh, in no way advocating for property damage or anything like that. But given the, I think we all can agree, chaotic situation of those three days following Jacob Blake's shooting, um, <clears throat> there was certainly a, a propensity for violence um, or maybe not just violence, but he also states that he came from outside of Kenosha to help, but it sounds a lot like what Kyle did. But Kyle is painted as a bad guy for crossing the state lines, even though he he basically lives in Kenosha too. His permit for his gun expired, but he didn't renew it when he was in the riots. He didn't renew it for a number of years. And he also doesn't recall if there was a round in the chamber, which doesn't make sense to me because why would you pull the gun if there wasn't one? He uses the word demonstrators instead of rioters a lot. Now, listen, I laughed at this, sure. But at the same time, I, I was talking about the use of the word victim in court, so I can't really harp on this guy about that. You can use the word demonstrators if he wants to. He says that he was basically being the micromanager of the thing and delegating things to random people to do medic things on his behalf. He was streaming Facebook that night. The first time he saw Kyle offering medical aid to someone was the person who was limping and being carried onto the property, and then someone yelled, don't let them treat you, and that person limped away. My immediate question when I looked at this was, if this guy is an EMT, why doesn't he go help the guy instead of attacking Kyle when Kyle shot like Hubert or Rosenbaum or whatever why doesn't he help him he was asked if he's ever heard Rosenbaum swear or say anything bad even though it's on footage that Rosenbaum was heard saying that shit I don't know what you what you're going for there also the again with Binger playing random movies that aren't even relevant the videos that he took aren't relevant besides the one one video that shows the shooting and Kyle running away to find the police after his shooting so again it further shows that Kyle was a good boy who wanted help I swear the prosecution is doing more to help Kyle than to defense is. Bicep Guy goes on to say that Balch said that there was a plan in place to push the protesters down towards the car park, which you've heard about. Bicep thinks that Kyle was a weird guy and very strange. He thought that Kyle said, I'm working with the police, and even though he clearly says that he thought that and he wasn't sure what they were actually what was actually being said and it's probably him mishearing, they're just running with that as if it's like documented that he actually said that. The militia yeah. since they refer to themselves uh to that object to that at least when you heard the defendant say what you thought was i'm working with the police did that bring back that other knowledge what mr balch had said yes <laughs> can we play the video forward just a few more seconds and then i'm gonna pause again he was an initially running away from Kyle and then he saw other people running towards Kyle and saying that Kyle shot someone. Then he just says, so yeah, as if that answers any of the questions. <laughs> he also says that Kyle's group was a self-proclaimed militia, even though they never said that about themselves once. He made the assumption that Kyle was an active shooter because if you bring a firearm to the equation, it's dangerous, despite the fact that you have a gun. He had a pistol holstered on his back but Binger says that he has it in his hand in the video they're playing when he runs to Kyle who's on the ground. Which, you know, it is actually true, but it's funny that Binger accidentally makes Bicep Man sound like a liar. Where was it? Um, like I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I, I keep my pistol uh, holstered uh, in the small of my back. But don't you have it in your hand at this point? In the moment, he thought that Kyle was an active shooter, and he testifies that Hubert hit Kyle with a skateboard, and in his eyes, you can see Bicep realize he fucked up by admitting that Hubert actually caused damage to Kyle by hitting him with a skateboard, instead of their narrative that the skateboard is just a, just a cutesy little accessory that can't actually hurt anyone. Cross, again. I had uh, heard several more gunshots, um, and again, making inferences, the defendant was the only one with a large caliber rifle. Saw another individual um, use his skateboard to hit the defendant. Um, <laughs> or okay. So I decided to team up. Or hold the defendant. He just realized he fucked up. With his and he does admit that he was prepared to use his gun if he had to. That's very convenient. He starts getting all emotional by saying that he thought he was going to die because Hubert was murdered and the judge has to step in to stop him from using that language. After Anthony Huber was shot, um, See in the video, I'm not too far behind him. Um, and the defendant had, after murdering Anthony Hugh. So please uh, keep that in mind that uh, people, when they're in the court and they're testifying, 
uh, they can be affected by their emotions, sometimes by their jobs. And, uh, and they will... The bicep then suddenly not only becomes an EMT expert, but also a firearm expert, and says that Kyle's gun jammed when he was intending to shoot bicep way earlier, so he re-racked it, meaning that even though the gun didn't go off the first time, he was trying to get it to go off the second time because he was really determined to shoot bicep guy. Which didn't happen and it's proven later that it didn't happen. But my thing is, if someone is coming at you and you shoot them and it doesn't work because the gun jams, and then they're still running at you to try and kill you, I think that it's okay to re-rack and like try and shoot them because if they're still trying to kill you and you need to get away that's what you gotta do right binger then asks why bicep man didn't shoot kyle sooner but bicep man is like no 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 it's 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 not who i am it's, it's not who i am i won't become this killer <laughs> like he's in an anime or something and his face is pretty dry for someone who's like trying really hard for those tears to fall he talks about his bicep sounding like the worst thing in the world which you know what i get it i i would probably freak out as well if my fucking bicep got fucking vaporized. He EMT explains everything in boring detail. <laughs> he also doesn't know why he picked up an empty tear gas bottle that he found on the street. Hmm. He was asked to hand over the contents of his phone and that he intended to but never refused to do so but just didn't do it. Which doesn't make much sense. But because he, he said he didn't refuse to but he he did it, it refused. He also has a tattoo that says do no harm on it. So the no is written K N O W on it. This is yeah, yeah, that, that, that. So there's this guy. I'm gonna call him Agent Baldy7. He is on the defense. He is so fucking cool. I love this guy. Basically, he's like Camilla from the Depp trial, if you remember her. She was so good. He's like so good on his feet. He's super confident. He asks all the right questions. He's like really thorough. Like nothing misses this guy. It's, it's fucking crazy. But he, on the cross-examination, he immediately catches Bicep Man in the lie about him carrying a gun instead of having it tucked into his back. Because even remember what Binger said, he had the gun in his hand, but Bicep Guy was trying to say that it was just tucked in the, the holster in his back, right? But Bicep Guy was intending to wave it around like a loony, like the rest of the loonies that were at the protest thing. He says no to the bald lawyer asking if he was chasing Kyle with a gun, and then he says he's not denying it. Like, you said no, you denied it. He's just like, well, I'm not saying it didn't happen, I'm just saying it didn't happen. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Pulling your gun chasing after him, that's a lie. You're saying that didn't happen. I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but I wasn't chasing oh. the defendant. You were running after him? No. No. He also never told the police that he was holding his own loaded gun, his Glock, at Kyle. He was at the violent revolutionary rallies talking about commie shit and long live the revolution. And he admits to doing this before he goes to the protest for god knows what purpose he had with the loaded gun. And remember, this is not Kyle's purpose of having protection. This is this guy, he, he didn't actually do any medic shit. He didn't actually help anyone. What was he doing there? Did you ever tell the police in here on this statement that you actually had a firearm in your hand and pointed it at the defendant? No, I did not. I know you said you don't know, but Jason Lakowski testified that he picked up that firearm that he believed belonged to you, and there was one in the chamber. You're a member of the People's Revolution? No, I'm not. Have you spoken at their rallies? I haven't won. And during that rally, uh, have you made statements such as, long live the revolution? I have. And you have no affiliation with them, though? Affiliation, yes. He refused to continue talking to the police because his lawyer said not to. He also has a civil suit against the police and the state for $10 million as a result of the injury in his bicep. But in the statement and the suit statement, which is very important, he forgot to mention that he possessed a firearm. He needed to include this in his documents, but he didn't, and it shows that if Kyle loses this case, Bicep gets his $10 million, so he's very incentivized to lie on behalf of the prosecution. Baldy7 asks if Bicep helped the limping person during the scene when they, they said, don't let them treat you, and Kyle wasn't able to treat the limping person. Bicep man says no. <laughs> I know you said that you heard people say something along the lines of, don't go to them. Do you help her out? No, I do not. They also have more of the video that Bicep Man shot, and it, he says, Go home, fucking stooge, to Kyle, who's asking if anyone needs a medic. Kyle had said and done nothing to him to warrant this behavior. 
Also, we get further clarification and admitted on Bicep's part that he was not legally concealing and carrying. He didn't have a permit for it, it had expired, and he'd never gone back and fixed that. He told the police Kyle had raised a gun at him, but he never mentioned that he said Kyle was working with the police in his statement, yet during Binger's whole thing there, he just said that and rolled with it, as if it was true. Why, if it was so important, why didn't you put it in your police statement? He was so certain that Kyle said that in his testimony, but not certain enough to actually say it to the police. Bicep Man was watching Kyle running away and saying that he was going to the police, and then Bicep Man decides to go up to chase Kyle while pulling his gun out of his holster on his back. You can also hear people coming after Kyle in a mob to chase him down. That's very evident on the video that plays. Drive people whatever word you want. It's getting bigger as they're running, isn't it? More people are joining us. I think that's a fair thing to say. The herd was chasing him. I and was just running with the herd, uh, but I wasn't chasing him. He also says, I didn't observe him kicking Kyle, but I observed him going over to over Kyle with his foot in the air. Like, yes, that's kicking. Going over. And he's going, if you remember, he's going over to the defendant with his foot in the air. Then they pull up the photo where the kick is making contact and, and he gets Bicep to admit that Kyle was in physical danger. As a, as a medic, you would probably know that, wouldn't you? He also admits that Hubert was causing head trauma, basically, because after Kyle had actually gone to the police station when he was sitting there waiting to be talked to, he started vomiting and yes, part of that was from shock, but he also felt really shitty because his head had been bashed in with a skateboard. Bicep man that said that even though he told the police he told Hubert to stop using the skateboard, it doesn't really make sense because on the stand he admits that he lied and didn't actually tell Hubert to stop using that skateboard. Telling Mr. Hubert, you just said the guy, but you tried telling the guy to stop hitting him with the skateboard. Is that right? That is what I put in my statement, yes. Is that true? I don't believe that to be true. He also admits that he left out the part where he lied about pulling his own firearm before Kyle shot him. He tries to guilt trip the defense by saying that he was out of surgery and traumatized, so he didn't mean to lie, but he can't get away with it, especially when Kyle was vomiting and had head trauma, but he still was completely truthful to the police. This officer specifically, what Mr. Rittenhouse was wearing, correct? That is correct. You had a thoughtful process, even though you just got out of surgery and were drugged and whatever else was going on, which I understand. You were still able to answer all those questions to the best of your ability, and they were at right? To the best of my ability, yes. Okay. Failed to mention that you possessed a firearm when you were shot, and that you dropped it. Were those things that you forgot because of your medication? I would say not only the medication, but also uh, the traumatic experience that I had just gone through but the people are retarded he like conveniently blacked out from his trauma on the shit that he did that would hurt the prosecution's case like that's really convenient man he also left out the gun re repeatedly on later interviews he also admits that he wasn't even served with a search warrant for his phone in the first place and did not give permission for them to take it so he did refuse to give his phone into the cops he admits that kyle acted in self-defense which is the whole point of this trial you it has been marked as exhibit 67 uh that's a photo of you yes yes okay. um that's mr Ritter. i love that he did this before he answered yes oh shit he should have said no and pointed off to the side i was dropping it down he says his, his gun has more rage than Kyle's because his is a Glock and he was willing to kill Kyle, also admitting that he did shoot at Kyle. They pull up Bicep's tweets from a few days ago showing that he was doing like wink wink nudge nudge posts like, oh we'll totally tell him that this happened when it didn't, haha. <laughs> he denies saying that he wishes he mag dumped Kyle but then they pull up the thing that shows that he does. He was basically spouting off shit as if he knew better at the time and you know how I said before that he was mic micromanaging a bunch of strangers to do medical shit for him at the protest? This is what Binger says that Kyle was trying to do. But Bicep Guy was actually the one who's trying to do that, so what does Binger have to say about that? Another boring cop that looks exactly like the other boring cops takes the stand and basically says that he acknowledges Kyle raised his hands and that is a non-threat, but when Kyle couldn't hear what his commands were at the cop car, he sprayed some pepper spray at Kyle even though he perceived Kyle as a non-threat, which is a bit strange. He also 
heard the gunshots, but he doesn't ID Kyle or do anything about Kyle's gun. So, like, I don't trust this guy to do his fucking job. They, you know how I said earlier that they had the guy that was in this video and he was doing commentary, but they didn't have his testimony as a witness in the case, so they shouldn't have used it? They hurriedly tracked him down and actually brought him in as a, as a witness. His commentary is useless and they act like he the rundown live is like some big news organization when he has like 45 subscribers <laughs> there's another boring police officer who does admit that he knew bicep guy lied about the gun and the attorney made bicep guy stop talking about the guns for the money reason he wasn't able to locate the other guns in the pistol at the scene in some of the pictures and then this this other guy comes in for like forensics and you know, I'm, I'm gonna cut some of it out because forensics people kind of talk in a boring tone, which I'm not trying to dig at them, it, it's a professional thing, but uh, I have the attention span of the fish. This forensics chad, honestly, outlines information in the photos where the soot of the barrel had touched Rosenbaum's hand in such a way that they show that Rosenbaum did indeed grab the gun by the barrel and was trying to get at it in order to take it from Kyle, but he couldn't because it was strapped to Kyle's body. Forensic expert doesn't understand what Glorb is saying at all either which is really funny when attorney richards was talking to you about the wound to mr rosenbaum's left hand and there's blood everywhere and there's so many places uh if he was holding say uh the a handle of something uh, would you expect that the soot and the, and the um uh, i'm not I'm, I'm not really sure i understand the question. This guy in the white hat is called in and he says that the business brothers wanted help because the cars were burning and all that nonsense that we've heard before. He said he didn't need a gun because he was on the roof. So he also gives further confirmation that Kyle was in more danger being on the ground being a medic because the guys on the roof were on the fucking roof, right? Somehow Binger can't tell the difference between up in air different from ground. This guy, De Bruin, photographer, I'm gonna try and find his like business stuff and link it below so that you can support him. He is so fucking cool. He's so talented. He's an absolute chad. He was pressured by the prosecutors and was like scared by them, but he didn't give a fuck. He was like, listen, I'm here for the truth. Support this guy, please. He is awesome. He was pressured to change his statement by Binger. So basically, Binger would be like, do you recognize this guy in this video that you took? And he's like, I don't know this guy. I don't know him. And then Binger would show him a picture and be like this man's name is Zelensky and then he would play the video again and be like do you recognize this guy and De Bruin would be like oh you just told me this guy is Zelensky so I guess it's Zelensky and then Binger would be like so do you want to change your statement do you want to say that you do recognize this guy because you know who he is now and he kept doing that over and over and over and over again and De Bruin was like this isn't lawful I'm not doing this I I, I don't want to change my statement it's not true like what you're doing doesn't make any sense video and also a photo, which was actually one photo that I brought today and asked me to, if I knew who a gentleman was in that photo. And I said, I did not. And he asked me to, oh, he, um, he said, this is uh, Joshua Zeminski. Um, I, he, Mr. Binger also has a case with him and I am subpoenaed for that case also. And he says, well, that's who that is. He put the phone down, he picked the phone back up and says, who is this? And I confusingly said, like, Joshua Zeminski. And he's like, would you like to add that to your statement? And I just felt, um, I hired an attorney. He also has the pictures with him showing that he, he captured Rosenbaum causing fires and horrible people doing horrible things, essentially. Binger then does a cross-examination. He is so fucking dirty. He's a dirty little rat. Photo Chad actually hired an attorney because of how Binger was acting. This guy is like a toddler. I say that you were very nervous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You! And we did have you read over your statement, right? Correct. And we asked if you knew anything beyond that statement. Correct. We didn't ask you to change it. You, yes, you did. Identify Mr. Zeminski. Or if I wanted to change any details to um, how to how I if I remember anything else throughout that night, it ended with Mr. Binger saying that he would be in touch with me in regards to the <laughs> Zeminski case. Because we indicated that we would subpoena you for that case. You did subpoena me for that case. And that was the absolute <laughs> end of the meeting? That I recall. 
Do you remember that afterwards you and I spoke about your photography and I complimented your photography? We talked about your photography. That was in the beginning. <laughs> what? <laughs> and at the end. Glorb then decides to do some of the asking himself, even though he's not very good at it. He complimented, he's like, I complimented your photography at the end of the meeting. Why weren't you nice to me and changed your statement? Glorb, I don't know what, is he just hungry? Why is he doing such a shit dub? He poorly summarizes and tries to gaslight photo chat on the events that just happened. And it's like, you don't, I don't think you're getting anywhere with this guy. He's also incredibly rude to photo chat and he keeps getting hung up on, on like, oh, you saw that the window at the police station was smashed in, huh? Huh? Like, okay, yeah. <laughs> and? I was threatened numerous times, so I was uneasy with people still standing outside the police department, walking in, knowing I have to walk out with these people out here. So you gave this statement 17 days after the shooting. Is that accurate? If, yeah. And you're still saying that property was being destroyed and there were protests there was seven no days later? Let me finish my question, please. This the week of the shooting, nothing to that extent, but there was no window in the police station. So, so De Bruyne was basically bringing up the window being smashed in because he was terrified to give his statement. He was very like on edge because of the destruction that had happened. It was like not, not a very comfortable place. And then when you have the tense nature of the prosecutors, it's going to add up to De Bruyne being on even more edge, you know? So he then says that there's so many people that he didn't see who was around in particular. He just saw a crowd. He didn't see who was in the crowd, right? Glorb takes that to say that this means that Kyle wasn't actually in the pictures? Sure, of Mr. Rosenbaum by a cone on fire? Yes. Like a traffic cone? Well, he's in the background just outside the driveway of the gas station. Right, I mean, at that time, you did not see Kyle Rittenhouse around there. And that didn't threaten anyone's safety relating a traffic cone on fire. No. Society, I have you surrounded. Turn yourselves in. You've been abusing this boy, and it ends here. I abused him. I abused the boy. All of you, collectively, society, give up while you still can. And you know there are media outlets here covering the trial. We're all we're all covering you as well here. This camera. Are you trying to indicate and that he's trying to get a you job? You actually have offered That's what he's your for. photographs for sale on that uh, blogger's site who spoke to you. He put those up. So are these photographs oh, copyright infringement? If somebody would want them, but I'm not average. <laughs> Did you bring your own exhibits because you're trying to uh, enrich yourself with your photography? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You're How dare money? you make money on your hobby? God, glor. Another guy is brought to the stand, Lucas Zenon, the guy who uh, he was basically just parked in his car with his stepdaughter who was filming things, so it's more video evidence. And he got videos of the car source, and it doesn't really- like, the, the, everything you've heard before, basically, so I'm gonna skip over it. On day 7, Bicep's roommate was basically trying to gas up Bicep and trying to take the fall on everything. This guy looks like he looks like he's a roommate to a communist, I'm just saying. He also starts playing the pity game because of how horrible his life is because of Kyle, because he posted that he and Bicep only regret that Kyle isn't dead on social media and people were like, hey, that's really violent. He, it's, and then he's like, why are people saying that what I said was bad? We finally get to day eight, glorious day eight, where Kyle takes the stand. He had heard about the protests and the riots in Kenosha, but he had heard about this happening mainly from social media. He saw police officers and business owners being beat up and attacked and threatened, and one of them had his head wired shut because of all of the trauma that had happened to his skull. On the morning of the 24th, the day that the, all of this happened, he went to the school to clean graffiti off with other people. They didn't know that they were being photographed at all, they were just doing it because it was heartbreaking seeing what was happening to their neighborhood. They then ran into the owners of the car source and they talked about the destruction of the cars that were lit on fire and all of the horrible things that were happening. They then went home for a bit and then drove to buy some stuff like rifle slings so that he could have his rifle safely on him while he uses both hands for medical aid and other things. This is also about the responsibility of owning a firearm because let's say you don't have a sling and you put your gun down while you're attending to someone. Someone else could easily run up to you and take that gun that you just had sitting on the ground and then do something else with it. So you're looking after your own firearm to make sure that it also doesn't fall into the wrong hands. It was Nick Welch's idea to go to the car source to help the people. Kyle had a bulletproof vest on him, but he said 
that he's doing medical, so he didn't really think that people would be shooting at him, and he decided to give the vest to Nick Welch. They got driven to the car source by the owner's brother, and some other people showed up that didn't know the group, but they just got acquainted and decided that they were gonna help out together. Kyle's plan was to go for the medical, with the first aid supplies that he always carried in the trunk of his car, and the supplies that he had for work. People split up to go to the different car source businesses to do their jobs, and Kyle goes to the second location with some people, including Nick and Dominic, his friend. He helped put out the fires at the church and whatnot, and this is the first time Rosenbaum attacked them verbally. When they were asking if anyone needed medics, and Rosenbaum said that he would fucking kill them if he saw them again. The second time was just outside the car source. Rosenbaum had said, I'm gonna cut your heart out and kill you. Then someone threw a chemical bomb, and Nick Belch had to be helped by Kyle to clean his eyes out from whatever the substance was. Kyle then saw Zeminski and Rosenbaum, two arsonists. Zeminski is one of the arsonists, took a trailer and light it on fire. Kyle helped a lady who sprained her ankle while he had been suffering from being prepper sprayed, but he just did his best. He also helped some guy with his shoulder. He then got threatened by the yellow pants guy on the video who mistakes Kyle for the one who had pointed a rifle at him in an earlier altercation. Kyle was not involved in whatever that was. He loses sight of Nick Balch and then goes to the ultimate gas station and this is where he was trying to find safety and he got a call to go to the third car location where there was a fire. Kyle asks people at the gas station to help him but they give him a fire extinguisher and say that they can't leave the gas station so he takes the fire extinguisher and runs towards the car source to put out the fire. He didn't notice that Rosenbaum was there until Rosenbaum comes out from behind a car and ambushes Kyle. As he's walking, he hears some hostile things here and there, so he shouts friendly, friendly, friendly because he's being yelled at to like die and you know, I'm gonna hurt you and all that kind of stuff. Zeminski, the arsonist, then jumps out at Kyle with a pistol and Kyle drops the fire extinguisher and runs back towards the car lot because he needs safety. As he's running, Rosenbaum starts following him and running at him. He actually breaks down and can't finish his sentence because he's having PTSD in, in front of everyone in the middle of the court. I, uh, my heart just broke watching this man. But luckily, after the break, he manages to power through it. Zeminski, the arsonist, had said, kill him to Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum then threw his plastic bag at Kyle, who thought it was something else because you can't really see what it is in the dark, and Kyle aims his gun as a deterrent. Rosenbaum does not take this deterrent seriously. He doesn't stop running, he keeps running. There was a gunshot fired from behind Kyle, and then Kyle has to brace as Rosenbaum lunges for the gun, and there was nowhere for Kyle to run, so he has to shoot Rosenbaum as Rosenbaum continues to attack him. He then runs around to see if he can help Rosenbaum, because Rosenbaum is bleeding, but there's a mob coming after him, so he can't stick around. He will die if he does. Richard McGuinness, the reporter, is there, and takes off his shirt and starts to tend to Rosenbaum. Kyle calls his friend Dominic about the killing while the mob starts yelling, get him, get him. Because the mob was so angry at him, Kyle decides for survival purposes, he has to say that he's not the one who shot anyone, you know, to make sure that they didn't fucking run after him. Because admitting that you shot someone regardless of context is a stupid thing to do in a bunch of rioters running after you. Hubert then starts running towards him and hits Kyle in the neck. Kyle keeps running for the police line, then gets lightheaded and hits the ground because he was struck. He gets struck with a concrete piece, and then some people kind of circle him, and one person continued to come at him despite Kyle brandishing his rifle. The person kicked Kyle in the face, and then Kyle shoots two shots so the guy can't curb stomp him. That guy survived because once he ran away, Kyle stopped shooting at him. Then Hubert moves in again while Kyle is down hits him, grabs the gun, forcing Kyle to shoot him. Then Bicep Man shows up, initially with his hands up, waits for Kyle to point his gun at the ground, and then Bicep Guy takes his pistol out and aims it at Kyle's head. Kyle had his rifle pointed downwards when Bicep Guy had his hands up because he didn't want to shoot a guy who had his hands up. Because Bicep pulled out his gun, Kyle has to shoot first. He shoots first and he shoots the Bicep to try and disarm the guy not to kill him. Another guy in the crowd has his hands up in front of Kyle and doesn't want to get shot because he was no threat, and Kyle doesn't shoot him because he's not doing anything. Then Kyle walked to the police line to turn himself in, and they turn him away. He couldn't go to directly to the police department because it was fenced off from the riot. He then gets driven home and his mom drives him to the police near his house an hour after the shooting. They didn't know who he was or what happened so he explained everything and reported on himself. He was told to sit down in the lobby and he was vomiting and dizzy and crying. So after this Binger decides to do his cross-examination, Binger is one of the rudest, most nasty people I've ever fucking seen. He tries to repeatedly frame Kyle as intending to shoot and kill. And then when Kyle answers his question after he's finished speaking, Binger is like, you didn't let me finish speaking. Like, are you a child? Played in this truck? Yes. 
Sir, if you could please let me finish my question. Binga gets chewed out by the judge. It's so fucking funny. This happens so many times. He brings up that buying the rifle is like, oh, you, you big bad because you, someone else bought a rifle with money that you gave them and you didn't have it, but like, that's too bad. Yep. I'm making the point that after hearing everything he's spoken. Case, now he's tailoring his story to what has already been introduced. The problem the evidence. this is a grave constitutional violation yes. for you to talk about the defendant's Judges violence. Sanction. And that is and, and, the, and you're right you're right on the you're right on the borderline. A Ooh, grave constitutional may, violation. Oh come on. You may be over it, but uh, it's better yeah. stop. Yes, you may well be over it. This is appalling. I can't believe yeah. the case the initial case. It's of, crazy. Uh, this is not permitted. Binga also brings up the statute that we talked about at the start, and remember how I said that the statute doesn't actually put Kyle in trouble at all, it's just the statute? The judge has to correct Binga to tell him that. You're a lawyer, you fucktard. Kyle also corrects Binga on card carrying ages, like, Kyle knows more about the law than this fucking asshole. In Illinois, I wasn't able to bring it home because I didn't have a Floyd card, a firearm owner identification card. You in knew Illinois. It. You knew in Illinois that you couldn't get that until you turned 18, correct? No, you can get a void card at 16 in Illinois. He asks if Kyle ever went to the shooting range, and Kyle says he did, and it's like, Binger's like, well, pay attention to my question properly, and it's like, why are you even asking that, though? Shooting range, ever. I did. Not with that rifle, but I did. Pay attention to my question, please. You didn't ever go. All of this just works. Binga tries asking Kyle if he only likes guns because of video games, and that line of questioning is so retarded that it actually gets dropped like really, <laughs> really early, and it never comes back because Kyle's like, you know that games aren't real life, right? Binga brings up the funny TikTok account again, which is hilarious to me, and tries to make it look like Kyle is trying to be a fake EMT, even though, like, even if Kyle says that, oh, I, I probably said I was an EMT, he didn't. On the video, he didn't. No one's talking about this. Binga then gets stuck on how the Kyle is 17 and it being illegal that he did something. Like, what are you trying to go for, man? He was trying to protect himself, not the property. Why are you bringing up that Kyle was shooting people for property? He was not doing that. He was protecting himself. He was nowhere near where he needed to protect some sort of property in front of him. He was only shooting because he was about to die. It's Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, the man who attempted to kick you in the face, and Gage Gross Courts on the night of August 25th, correct? Yes. And you did that because you felt that your life was in danger from those four people, correct? Yes. And you are telling this jury that it was, in your mind, justified to use deadly force to protect your own life, correct? Yes. You'd agree with me that you were not allowed to use deadly force to protect that car source building. Right. Well, I, I wasn't using deadly force to protect the property, I used deadly force to protect myself, so... <laughs> it's also, like, such a bad cross-examination that the judge keeps telling him to stop, and Binger is trying to, like, weasel his way into the judge's good books, and it's not working. It's so fucking cathartic. Even Richards makes fun of Binger. Like, come on. You know, it wasn't excluded, Rob. You know why it was excluded in the first place? Because it's it was propensity evidence. That is exactly what 90404 is designed to prevent. You're talking mm. about his attitudes. His attitude is he wants to shoot people. Now, I've admitted that kind of evidence in other trials when it's been appropriate. I didn't admit it in this case because to me, what I've heard in this trial, and by the way, Mr. Richards absolutely correctly points out that just hours ago, I said I had heard nothing in this trial to change any of my rulings. That was before so the why? Testimony, Your Honor. Pardon me. That was before the Don't get testimony. brazen with me. So. Kyle didn't have a driver's license at the time, but he drove to work and, and to his friend's house, which was like a 10 minute drive or something. And you know, like, yeah, he didn't have a license, but it's not really relevant to the charges at hand. Binger tries to bring it up and everyone's like, can you fucking not? Binger also tries to make it sound like Kyle shouldn't have had a, had a gun at all because he was doing medical. This big 
narrative that Binger has is that anyone who has any sort of medical job will never have a gun, as if military medical <laughs> people don't exist. Kyle also has to explain what a full metal jacket bullet is to Binger, because Binger, the lawyer, <laughs> doesn't know what that is. Even the judge knows more about guns. The judge has to, has to correct this man on guns. Because, let me... I'm, I'm being serious. I'm being serious right now. This guy... This, this guy actually says full metal jacket bullets are bad because hollow points are also bullets that exist and hollow points are really dangerous. So therefore, because hollow point bullets exist and are dangerous, full metal jackets are also classified as bullets and because they're associated with hollow point bullets, they're also really dangerous. Type of casing. Yeah. Uh, full metal jacket is the bullet type. The bullet type. Okay, I apologize. And you're aware there are different types of bullets like hollow point in the process of purchasing this gun. Well, let me back up for a second. You said that the 30 rounds of ammo were left over from previous. I assume you mean when you were up in Ladysmith? Yes. And you would shoot at targets as far as, what, 75 yards away? No. That the AR-15 was capable of hitting targets much further away than you would the TV, correct? I believe so. Did you know the capabilities Point. of your own weapon? So you didn't know what type of ammo was in that gun. Is that I, right? I knew they were 223 full metal jackets. I as you sit here today, you know that there are different types of bullets, right? <laughs> then Agent Baldy7 tries explaining why Binger isn't competent enough to cause a mistrial. This was just like an important sort of thing where the jury was out of the room and everything and people were just like talking. The judge yells at Binger for bringing up random news articles and shit that doesn't make sense and like also yells at Binger because because Binger was like, I'm in good faith and the judge is like, are you though? <laughs> Binger's argument is that Kyle should have seen what, uh, that Rosenbaum clearly doesn't have a gun when Rosenbaum had his shirt off, which doesn't make sense because you can hide a gun in other places. He literally says, when Rosenbaum said he was going to kill you, you took that as a threat even though he didn't touch you physically besides when he touched you physically, right? <laughs> he tries to make it sound like Kyle is chasing Rosenbaum when that didn't happen at all. He also says that Kyle putting out fires in the community wasn't a good thing because it's not Kyle's community when he lives just outside of the community and works in the community. It is his community. But you, at some point as you get close to the 63rd Street, I mean, it's you fair. start running. Towards that line. It was, it was right. moon bright. The fire Get the almanac. Caramax. And Mr. Rosenbaum is running ahead of you, isn't he? I don't, I don't believe so. But you decided you needed to run because of the fire on the Duramax? Yes. Why? What was so urgent? It was a fire. <laughs> There's fires all over the place, so? <laughs> I was getting to the fire to put it out. We'll, we'll get back to that in a second. You indicate why Binger is still on the fire. Like Binger is genu genuinely staking his entire whole chest on the fact that fires are apparently not a bad thing. He he's also like, so you were gonna put out a fire, right? If that's none of your business. We societally just call nine one one. Okay, the fact that you actually tried to put out a fire and like do something yourself—that's not cool. Okay. Collectively, society, give up while you still can. I'm giving you one last chance before my next last pre-chance. Can we have one Saint Swithin's Day without this crap? Hands on your heads and lay on the ground. If you have handcuffs, kindly slip them on. If you resist, be a deer and taser yourselves. When you see someone in danger, you don't help them. You're supposed to stand there and call 911 and pull out your phone and just like idle there like an NPC. That's what we should do as a society, okay? His argument basically becomes, if you knew that they were going to kill you or yell at you, why did you step outside the property line at all if you were going to die? And then Kyle has to explain for like the 17th time that he was already running out to put out a fire in an emergency. If you were just trying to help, why why would you expect someone to hurt you? Why did you have a gun? If you don't think anyone is hostile towards you, why did you have a gun? Right after Binger shows the video of a violent riot. Does this man have brain tumors? He also asked Kyle if there was any threat to the car source after the protesters and the rioters had been pushed back by the police line that had gone through the area. Kyle keeps saying that he doesn't know specifics or, you know, he doesn't know, why would he know? But Binger keeps bringing up the same questions even though they're asked and answered like a hundred times. After Kyle is done, they bring up this AI enhanced video that would- it, it shows a lot of things that aren't actually like real compared to the actual photo and it's quite dangerous, especially in the, the way 
wake of like the new AI boom that we currently live in. If you know this channel, you already know that I hate AI because I'm an artist, but like this is even more dangerous because if the AI like showed the, the gun in Kyle's like opposite hand and it, it was weird. But the judge is like, I don't know how I'm supposed to put this into evidence when it's like altered. Kyle says that Rosenbaum didn't say he'd take the gun. He physically grabbed the gun. He doesn't have to announce what he's doing right before he does it. But Binger says that because he didn't verbally say it, even as he's grabbing the gun, we couldn't possibly know what his intentions were. The Binger also bullies Kyle almost to tears. B Binger asks Kyle why he didn't help Rosenbaum, but we we've been told in the story that Kyle was trying to check out the scene and see if Rosenbaum was okay when he had to run for his life because of a violent mob. I said I'm gonna kill you. I would have let Mr. Rosenbaum get my gun, he would have killed me. And when you assume- You had already pointed your gun at him. Yes, he charged me. chasing me. Did you want him to think that you were gonna shoot him? No, I never wanted to shoot Mr. Rosenbaum. Why'd you point yeah, at him? Pulling him into crying, that'll be a good shooting. fucking look, you ass. He was chasing me. I was alone. He threatened to kill me earlier in that night. He's making a I didn't want to have to shoot him, kill anybody. Then why are you shooting at someone with an AR 15 at close range if I you don't, don't want, want to, to kill die? Him? Because he's attacking me and stomping my face in. Yes. <laughs> Jumping and <laughs> kicking my face in. That, you didn't see any weapons. Are you fucking oh my weapon? No, I couldn't. Didn't see his foot was too close no. to my face. You didn't see a knife? No. So, like, he was stomping your face in, sure, but you didn't see any weapons, so, like, there was no way for you to really feel like you're in danger. Your face was just being stomped in. That's not, like, actual danger. On day nine, the judge asks why Binger is sulking, and Binger is like, but did, well, you're being a meanie to me by not letting me do what I want in court. <laughs> This is a grown man. Hey, uh, is there something that I'm saying that God is the face that you're making? <laughs> hey, a finger face. He called that finger face. Say, Your Honor, yesterday, I was uh, the target of your ire. Oh, oh he's a victim. God. He's a victim. Oh. Well, here we go. They also get the defense expert in, John Black. He just kind of reiterates what we already know, and the whole point of this is to prove it for the jury and whatnot, but, you know, because I'm recapping it, it's boring. They bring in some other photo guy who basically confirms what we know about Rosenbaum being retarded. All of the gaps when Rosenbaum ran out of sight of our main witnesses, this guy had video and testimony to confirm that Rosenbaum was continuing to be a crazy bitch. Then they have this editor guy come in who was supposed to enhance the footage and they can't even verify if the AI footage changes anything to make the video inaccurate, so it's like they can't actually use it, like I said before. During closing arguments, now this is, this is spicy, Binga starts his closing, he's the first one. He says that Kyle kills people for no reason, and he even has a little PowerPoint summary of what happened to reiterate all of his bullshit that isn't real. He tries to sneak in a gun charge and the curfew charge in there, and it's a, it's an instant objection. He says that Hubert rushed forward with a skateboard to try and be a hero to stop an active shooter. That is clearly not what... I'm tired. He plays the videos again, he just plays the whole like Lord of the Rings extended trilogy just, just to waste the jury's time. I'm sure that they were falling asleep at this point. He is actually in charge of the prosecution of the arsonist Zeminski who was there at the time, which to me is a bit worrying because if you're so bad at your job that you present this sort of display during the trial as high profile as written houses, how are you supposed to put an arsonist behind bars if you can't even do your job properly? He then, okay, okay, this, this is this is the real. So you know how I said that he was making such a big deal about pointing things at the jury and he's like, I don't want to make anyone feel threatened. I don't want to point this at you accidentally. He points the gun at the entire jury and then he just puts it down like nothing happened. All of the video he plays, he basically cuts off anything that doesn't display his point. Like, he's like, well, Rosenbaum may have looked like he grabbed the gun because there was soot on his hand from the gun, but like, there were no prints on the gun, so he didn't do it. There's also no evidence that Mr. Rosenbaum ever wanted the defendant's gun. He never said I'm gonna- Uh, I don't know if there's no indication that he didn't grab the gun, because like, grabbing the gun is a pretty good indication that he grabbed the gun. Don't know about you though, that's just me, that's my hot take of the day. Um was going to take that gun and use it on the defendant because they know you can't claim self-defense against an unarmed man. 
but the people are retarded firing warning shots is reckless endangerment i don't give a fuck who you are i don't care that i'm not a lawyer if you just shoot off into some random distance you're gonna hit something like i said if you're gonna shoot at something you better make sure that you want to shoot at it right you, who knows what you're actually shooting if you just fire into the ether, you fucking idiot. He also compares Kyle's gun possession to the possession of cocaine for some reason. He states that Kyle has to get supplies for the medica for his medic thing from other people when this is also objectively false. He had it in the trunk of his car, it was his. He says it's okay to protect property when he says the opposite a while back. Your entire thesis was that property is not the same as human life. Uh, he wrapped up an ankle and I think to maybe help somebody who got a cut on their hand. Yay. So in the, the defense closing argument, Richards basically just clears up how Rosenbaum was not shot in the back in the way that uh, Binger was saying. He clears up how Rosenbaum was purely walking towards the protests and not just ending up at the protests magically as if he didn't intend to go there. He also brought up the medication. His PowerPoint's better than Binger's PowerPoint because his PowerPoint has dark mode on. Th this is not the end though because the, the prosecution decides that they haven't had enough. They need to dig their graves even more. So Glorb gets up to do his rebuttal. This is genuinely one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen in my life. Glorb is genuinely just a disgusting person. First he said, no one is saying Kyle didn't have a right to defend himself when the entire trial is about that. No one is saying that Mr. Rosenbaum should have chased Mr. Rittenhouse. No one is saying that Mr. Rittenhouse did not have a right to defend himself. Um. He said that the standard is that it could cause death or great bodily harm to Mr. Rittenhouse, or that it is likely to cause death or great bodily harm to Mr. Rittenhouse. That is absolutely not what the standard is. And that wow. is not what this trial is about. You don't just immediately get to shoot someone. And I don't care about provocation or any of that. Put that aside. For any person, for any 17 year old male to not try and defend yourself first using other methods. And he's too cowardly what? to use his own fist to fight his way out. What? He has to start no. shooting. No. And let's just say, Man, theoretically, that the 12 of you think that it is reasonable to have used a Fifth Amendment right. This is a criminal defense attorney. Stop. There's Stop. the objection. Stop it. Ooh. Yeah. Stop, stop. That when you get a couple scrapes. Really? Everybody takes a beating sometimes, right? Uh, no! Oh, no. Uh, oh. Oh. He was too cowardly to use his own fist to fight his way out. Are you mentally challenged? He's very, very angry at the jury. Like, calm down, dude. You're being a bit of a threatening force, aren't you? Everyone takes a beat. Tell that to someone who went through domestic abuse. Please. Glob, look them in the eye and tell them that everyone just needs to take a beating sometimes. Please, look at a, look a child in the eye who had been beaten by his alcoholic parents and tell him, oh, it's okay, little Timmy. Everyone needs to take a beating sometimes. You are disgusting. Thankfully, on the fourth day of the jury deliberation, they find Kyle innocent. And it's so good. <laughs> it's so refreshing. Oh my god. But, yeah. That's, uh, well, what was it that, that, um, Gage Grosskreutz said as, like, a non-answer? He was like, um, so yeah. So, <laughs> that's how I'm gonna end this video. Um, so yeah. <laughs> the, what did you think of that? Honestly, it's kind of awkward sometimes because I, when I make these really long videos, I have so much to say. And then when I get to the end, it just doesn't seem appropriate to, like, summarize things like an essay. So I kind of just leave it and I don't really end the video properly. So... I don't really know what to do here. Tell me what you thought. Also, Americans in particular, because not only was this an American case, but you guys have to deal with people coming for the Second Amendment, like, all the time. And I really wanted to hear what you have to say about that, because, like, I know I'm not American, but I'm pretty supportive of the amendment, believe it or not. <sighs> anyway, I'm fucking tired. See ya.